I travel quite a bit for my job, and most of the time I drive myself. It takes me all over the country, and typically I enjoy it quite a lot. I've also had some interesting experiences though. One of those happened two years ago now. I was driving home still a good distance away. I was somewhere in Arkansas, I believe, seemingly in the middle of nowhere for some reason. I remember I was not on the highway, but I was on a quieter road. I don't quite recall if there had been some construction or a detour or if I took a wrong turn or what, but on both sides of this road was just grass and trees, occasionally a big patch of woods as well. I remember that my signal went out on my phone. Obviously, I was following the directions on it, but they went away as soon as my phone signal did. Nothing would load, and I just had to hope I was traveling in the right direction. It very quickly started to become later and later at night. I hadn't booked a hotel yet, but I had been planning to do so when I stopped for gas. Eventually, I remember my car made a noise, and I realized I was running very low on fuel. Meanwhile, I still had no service. The last thing I wanted to do was be stranded out here with no signal and no fuel and no way to get help. I decided I would take the next exit and hope there was a gas station up ahead somewhere. About a mile later, I saw a road on the right that looked promising. I turned down it and started driving. Soon, I did see a sign for a gas station, but it was down yet another road. The sign said it was about four miles down that way. It seemed pretty far, but I could still make it, so I drove the four miles. I soon arrived at said gas station, and when I got there, I saw it was certainly in the middle of nowhere. There were trees and wildlands all around it, but other than that, there were no businesses or buildings or cars or anything nearby. I parked next to one of the gas pumps and checked my phone. Still no service. I looked over to the convenience store connected to the small gas station, but it was closed. Luckily, the pumps were still open though, it seemed. I got out of my car, and I was kind of amazed at how crazy quiet it was. I started fueling my vehicle, and I peeked around a bit further. There were no other cars driving by, no vehicles parked anywhere. When I was looking around, I looked into the direction of the small convenience store building, only to see that there was a man standing behind it on the side. He appeared to be trying to hide, and he was peeking right at me. I was wondering who this man could possibly be, and what he was doing here with no vehicles in sight. It was really sketchy. I couldn't figure out that many details about the man because of how dark it was and how far away he was from me. I looked away and tried to keep my mind off it by looking elsewhere, but I just had a really bad feeling about this guy. I thought about just shutting off the gas even though the tank wasn't full yet. However, I was in the middle of nowhere and I knew I might need a lot of fuel to get where I needed to go. I let it continue to run and looked back over in the direction of this suspicious man. He was still there hiding and still looking at me in this creepy way. It was unsettling to say the least. When my gas tank was full, I started to take the pump out and noticed the man had disappeared behind the building. I was glad that he was out of my sight and also wondered what he was doing. I got inside my car breathing a sigh of relief. I then started the engine and checked my phone yet again for service. I still had nothing. I was about to drive away when I noticed a car driving around from behind the gas station. I don't even think that car had been on the road. I'm pretty sure it was parked behind the building, which was just all dirt. I realized that it was likely the man who had been watching me. I started to drive away and saw the headlights of the car behind me follow. Now, I was once again really creeped out. Whoever this guy was was surely tailing me. He had his brights on, so I couldn't tell any of the details of what he looked like. I moved over to the side of the road, hoping he would pass me by, but he stayed right on me. 
I didn't know what to do. It's not like I could drive down to a police station because I didn't know where any of them were in the area. I also didn't have any service on my phone to look it up. At least I had a full tank of gas though. I would have to just drive and hope to find a place I could go to or lose the tailing of this car behind me. I drove back towards the highway I had previously been on earlier in the day, but after going straight for a while, I panicked and turned. I drove down this street a little ways and turned again. I really had no idea where I was going. I just kind of felt like if I turned a lot, maybe the guy behind me would get tired of following me, or maybe he'd get lost. He didn't seem to, though, and remained right on my tail. Eventually, I turned down something that led to a slightly larger and busier road. However, nobody else was out at the time. I didn't see a single other vehicle. The guy remained right behind me as I drove down this road for a while. I turned again and again at just about every single opportunity. After turning randomly for probably 15 or more minutes, I decided to just go straight for a while. I didn't know where I was, but I was honestly tired of turning and driving down mystery streets. All of a sudden, the car behind me just turned onto a random road. I had to look twice. I couldn't even believe my eyes, but they were finally gone. I kept driving and turned down another road, just in case the car changed its mind. From there, I checked my phone again, but still no service. I decided to keep driving down this road until I got signal again. It took me almost an hour, but finally I had some coverage. I first looked up directions to a nearby town. I then found a hotel room and called the police to report the whole situation. I'm not sure if the man was ever located. I'm not sure how they would, really. I still wonder who he was and what he was trying to do. I'm just really glad I made it out of there. Back when I was a sophomore in high school, I used to be very close friends with this girl, Kay. Kay and I met in middle school, and we instantly clicked. We would hang out after school very frequently. Kay had a very turbulent childhood. Deceased father, foster care, substance abuse mom, and Kay's family would house up a lot. Our sophomore year, Kay's family was staying with their step-aunt's ex-husband. My parents never really stressed out about me hanging out with Kay because she was such a kind soul and a great influence on me. Now, the man Kay was staying with at the time was interesting to say the least. I remember the first incident that made me really scratch my head was when we all went out to dinner with Kay and her family. Richard tagged along. Kay and I were sat at the table with him and he was venting to us about his dating life and showing us pictures of his Tinder bio. He talked about all the women he was chatting to. We both kind of laughed it off and engaged with him, but we didn't really think too much of it. Sometimes when Kay and I hung out, Richard would have us come to the basement. He had this room with a drum kit down there and he'd play them for us with the lights off. Anyway, the strangest encounter I personally had with him was when I went to Kay's house to hang out one day. She went to take a shower, and while she was in the shower, I was sitting down in her room. Richard wandered in and told me he wanted to show me something cool in his room. Kay's room was on the first floor, and Richard's was the only room up on the second floor. Being the naive girl I was at the time, I agreed and followed him up the stairs. When we got to his room, he realized that his room was locked and seemed to get very annoyed and jittery. He left his key downstairs. Now, instead of going downstairs, Richard took out his credit card from his wallet and tried to unlock the door that way. Thankfully, it didn't work. Something clicked in my brain in that moment and I decided to go back downstairs and sit in the bathroom with Kay until she was done with her shower. I'm 23 now, and looking back on it, I don't think there was any cool thing to show me in that room. 
I thanked the moon and the stars that he didn't manage to get it unlocked. I never told Kay about the incident, but as we started to get older, I casually asked if she'd ever had any strange encounters with him herself. She said no. I'm not really sure how to end this, but I'm thankful I didn't get to see what was beyond that door. Back in the year 2000, when I was 11, my mother, my brother, and myself flew from West London to Perth, Australia to spend five straight weeks there for my uncle's wedding. My uncle's place was practically a palace almost. He lived in this gated community, with several security guards patrolling the area, he even had one of those pin-drop sensitive alarm systems. On the fourth day of our visit there, all the adults went out for a party. My brother James, who was 13, and myself were going to be left all alone in my uncle's place for a while. Given that the place was as secure as Fort Knox, though, no one was very concerned about us being on our own. Our mother promised to be back by 1am and left us our mobile number. They set the alarm and then left. Afterwards, James and I just kind of wandered around the house for a while. It almost felt like we were in a museum or something. Every door and window we found was closed and locked. Eventually, we went back to the living room and began to watch a movie. We had the volume set pretty high because we wanted to take advantage of my uncle's surround sound. About 30 minutes in, James paused the movie and tilted his head sideways, as if he was listening in to something. After a few seconds, he shrugged and resumed the movie. Less than five minutes after that, he paused again and looked towards the foyer. James and I were in the living room, and the wall that separated us from the foyer had this rectangular decorative opening with cast iron bars inside it. Beyond the opening was just a bunch of darkness. There weren't any lights on in the front of the house. I asked what he was doing, and he quickly shushed me. He sat there in silence for a few moments, then slowly seemed to relax and settled back into his seat. We resumed the movie. About 15 minutes later is when I began to hear it as well. There was footsteps coming from the front of the house. It sounded like heavy boots on marble, and for us to be able to hear it over the surround sound, Whoever was there was certainly not trying to be quiet. Surprisingly, neither of us freaked out. We didn't even pause the movie again. My brother just picked up the landline and called my mom's number. We both stared out into the dark foyer, waiting for someone to peek their head around that decorative window and peer in at us. My brother had to call a few times before my mom finally answered. He stated, much more calmly than I could have ever managed, that he was sure someone was in the house with us. My mother instructed him to hit the panic button on the security system and hide in one of the ground floor bedrooms. She stated she was on her way. I remember James and I looking at each other with apprehension. The panic alarm button was in the closet in the foyer, and that was where we had last heard the footsteps coming from. I cautiously stood up, feeling like I was detached from my own body almost, like it was a dream. I carefully wandered over to the hallway that led into the foyer. I didn't take another step when I noticed the motion sensor in the upper corner of the room. My uncle had these motion sensors in every room that would trip the alarm when no one was home. When we were there though, the motion sensors were still on, but they would not set off the alarm. They would, however, flash red whenever they detected movement in the area. From my peaking position, I could see the lights were flashing red. I was too far away for it to be sensing me. Someone was in there, and they were moving around. I backed up, and James immediately grabbed my hand. He must have seen the look on my face. He led me into the kitchen. Being the scared kids we were, our first instinct was to hide away in the pantry. We were only there for a minute or so, because we realized just how stupid that was to try and hide there. 
we needed to get out of that house. We left the pantry and grabbed two knives from the knife block. What better way to make the situation even worse than by running in a panic out the back door into darkness while clutching massive knives? As soon as we opened the door in the kitchen, the alarm started blaring. I glanced back towards the decorative window and caught a glimpse of a man in a blue shirt peeking through it at us. James and I sprinted around the side of the house without even bothering to try and unlock the gate. James told me to slide my knife under the gate, and he did the same. We both jumped over it and ran across the street. I was half convinced the man would be right behind us, trying to catch us, but I didn't see him again. In fact, we didn't see anything else from inside the house until security arrived about a half minute later. By then, we were sitting on the curb on the opposite side of the street. We heard a loud thudding noise from the second floor. The security guards stood with us, and police arrived minutes later. Three of them ran inside the building, using the key the security guard provided to enter, and they swept the house. Our mother arrived and held us tight until the police had the alarm shut off. They exited the house and claimed that they'd found no one inside, but the master bedroom on the second floor had been completely ransacked. Furniture had been tossed across the room, which obviously hadn't been like that earlier. When my uncle arrived, he did a walkthrough of the home and sifted through the mess in his bedroom. He concluded there was nothing missing. James and I were terrified when we heard from the police there was no way the man could have gained entry while the alarm was on. It was much more likely that he had been in the house the entire time, laying low until after all the adults left. Since the intruder never came around our side of the house while we were escaping, they concluded he must have run out back and jumped the stone wall, escaping by running on foot down the freeway. One thing has never sat right with me all these years later. If that guy had been there to rob the place, he could have easily overpowered James and I while we were on the couch, or could have chased us down when we were running. I mean, he had to have known we were there when he came out of his hiding place. The surround sound from the movie was blaring. Obviously, he didn't want to be seen by us, but it also seems that he didn't try to hurt us. That made me suspect over the years that he must have been someone we both knew, though I didn't recognize him based on the glimpse I caught of him. I'm also not completely convinced that my uncle was telling the truth when he said that nothing was missing. Maybe my uncle knew who the man was the whole time, but didn't want to turn him in. I mean, that's just a theory, but otherwise, I have no idea why a complete stranger would lay low in our house and remain hidden from us, only to not chase us when he saw us there, and only ransack the bedroom before running away without stealing anything. I was driving alone from eastern Colorado to Wyoming in the middle of the night on a dirt road. It was the type of darkness that most people will never get to experience, like being stuck in the middle of the ocean, no cities or even small towns, for hundreds of miles in every direction. Once I hit the border of Wyoming, the road became pavement after about a half an hour. I heard this loud bang all of a sudden, and my car pulled hard to the middle of the road. I had a flat tire. I pulled over and got out. It was as quiet and as dark as it can possibly be. There was not a single light of any kind for hundreds of miles, except for the headlights of my car. I started changing my tire by myself, feeling extremely uneasy about being alone so in the middle of nowhere. I got my tools and my spare tire out of the trunk and started changing that flat as fast as I could. For some reason, I had the feeling I had to try my best to be quiet. It felt like every little sound I made was incredibly loud. I even turned my music off as well. I crouched down, finishing up tightening the lug nuts on the spare tire, when I heard someone call out from right behind me. Hey there, need any help with that? 
I spun around and stood up fast. No one was there. I looked across the street to the other lane, and no one was there either. I grabbed my tire iron and started yelling into the darkness. Who's there? It was dead silence. I mean, I could hear my heart beating, but I could barely even see the other side of the road because of this extreme darkness. I knew there was nothing anywhere around me but dirt and sagebrush. I hurried and spun the jack down. The whole time I had the distinct feeling someone was right behind me in the darkness watching me. I quickly threw all the tools in the trunk with the flat. I could not jump back in my car fast enough. I felt that presence there in the darkness. I felt like someone was going to try and stop me from closing the door. I slammed it shut as fast as I could, and I sped home to Wyoming, freaked out the whole time. I kept checking my back seat over and over again. It was such a frightening experience, and I never even caught a glimpse of the person who was there that night. When I was younger, my family and I went on a road trip to Wyoming to see Yellowstone National Park. It's a real beautiful place, and if you've never seen it before, I would highly recommend it. From our home in California, it was about a 17-hour drive in our Yukon XL, which is the largest, most comfortable road trip SUV you can imagine. It took us several days' worth of on and off driving to get there, and during nights we tried to find a little motel to rest at. On one of the nights, due to us being a bit behind schedule, my dad attempted to drive through the night to get us there sooner. He made it probably into the wee hours of the morning before he deemed it unsafe to go any further. He parked us in this unlit rest stop in the middle of the woods in some flyover state. My brothers and I had fallen asleep in the car several hours before he had stopped, so for the last couple of hours, so for at least a couple of hours, we were all sleeping in the car in this dark little parking lot surrounded by forest on all sides. Having a couple of hours of sleep now and being in a pretty uncomfortable position, I was woken up in the middle of the night. I was pretty disoriented, but not really scared per se. I looked around and saw everyone else fast asleep in the pitch black car. I naturally felt pretty alone in that moment. I tried to fall back to sleep, but for some reason it was just not working out. I just sat there for a while, boredom really setting in. I looked out the window to see where we were. It was pitch black outside, so I couldn't really see anything. Luckily, I was the type to pack a light on me. I had brought a couple of flashlights in my bag, so being careful not to disturb my sleeping family, I unzipped my bag and reached into it and pulled out a little plastic yellow flashlight. It wasn't the brightest around, but it was enough to see the foreground of the general surroundings. I put it up to the glass, making sure not to make any noise, and pushed the little switch into the on position. I pressed my face against the glass and looked out. At first, it looked like a normal tree line with some bushes and trees and whatever. As I scanned the darkness looking for animals and buildings, though, I noticed this distinct dark shape standing in between two trees in the distance. It looked clearly like the shape of a man, but it wasn't moving at all. It was just standing there. After watching it for a good while and seeing no real signs of movement, I just assumed it was a bush of some kind or some sort of natural occurrence. Just as I was about to turn the light off and reattempt sleep though, I saw that shadowy shape turn 90 degrees and hide behind a tree, disappearing from sight. That scared the hell out of me. I immediately turned off the flashlight and threw my sweater turned blanket over my head shutting my eyes tightly and covering my ears. I was paralyzed with fear. I sat in this semi-fetal position, clutching my flashlight for the rest of the night. I waited until the sun came up and we were back on the road before I got any sleep. 
I didn't tell anyone about the man that I saw in the woods. I almost didn't believe he was real. So, I was the manager of a hotel when what I'm about to tell you occurred. It was around 1am and no new guests had arrived for a couple of hours. It was seeming like it was going to be a pretty slow night. I was talking to one of the employees about how whenever a night is this slow or quiet, something bad usually happens. They said I was just being superstitious, but I've since come to realize that that really is the truth. I've seen a lot during my 10 years as a manager. Plenty of domestic disturbances, fights in the hallways, drug deals gone wrong. The list really does go on and on, but that night had to have been the worst. At around 1.30 a.m., after my co-workers were finally finished telling me how ridiculous I was being about the quiet night, I got a call from one of the rooms. I answered and was met by the voice of what seemed like a little boy. He sounded like he was around five years old at most, and he started telling me that he really wanted his mommy, and I had to go get her. I asked the boy if he was alright, and he said yes, but that he just wanted his mommy. I started to get real concerned. Just as I was going to ask what room number he was in, a man came to the phone and identified himself as the boy's father. He apologized for his son wasting my time. Before I could even get a word in, the line just went dead. We were old school, so we couldn't even tell what room the boy had called from. I started to get worried, so I started asking around to my employees. Did any of them remember a man checking into a room with a little boy? I was having no luck until I asked our restaurant manager. He said a man had come in with a child earlier that night and he had used a voucher we gave all our guests. Thankfully, it was the only voucher used that day and it had the room number on it. I grabbed one of the largest men we had on staff and headed for the room right away. I had no intentions of confronting the man or really asking any questions even. I just wanted to check and make sure that boy was okay. I grabbed a few towels and told my employee to wait at the end of the hall. I knocked on the door and a man answered. He was a short chubby guy that smelled horribly of alcohol. Behind him on the bed was the little boy. He was so skinny I could see his ribs and he was covered in bruises. I tried to act calm and told the man I had the towels he'd requested. He of course denied requesting any towels and shut the door in my face. I turned around and ran down the hall to the elevator. Once I was back at the front desk, I immediately called the police. I was instructed to act naturally and not make any further contact with the man to avoid him running away with the boy. My heart was racing and I was sweating profusely. As I waited for the police to arrive, they surrounded the building and rushed in by the dozen. I told them what room the man was in and gave them the key as well. They had me come up with them in case there was a problem gaining access to the room. I didn't really want to go up there myself, but if there was any chance they could help that boy, I was going to take it. The elevator ride seemed to last forever. As I thought out every possible scenario for what was about to go down, the elevator stopped. I and eight officers stepped off into the hallway and we walked down towards the door. They had me wait closer to the end of the hall. I was terrified as I watched them knock on the door and demanded the man to come out. He refused and said he would kill the boy if they tried to get in. In that moment, things became very real. I believed him. They tried to negotiate with the man for almost an hour, but he was relentless and determined to stay in that room as long as possible. Finally, they decided to just blitz the room. It almost felt like everything was in slow motion. It was yelling, paired with the sounds of things crashing around the room. Before I knew it, they were walking out with the man in handcuffs. Behind them came another officer, running out with the boy in his arms. He could barely even hold his head up. He was put in an ambulance and rushed to the hospital. He made a full recovery and was reunited with his mother later that morning. 
The floor of the hotel had been closed off while they investigated. I learned later on that the man who was with the boy really was his father. Apparently, the wife was leaving him and taking their son because of his abusive tendencies. He'd taken the boy and threatened to hurt him if she left him. They had been on the run for over a month now. It also unfortunately turned out that the man was no stranger to abusing his son. The bruises were caused by him beating the little boy for daring to call up the front desk. I cried for days for that kid. I wanted so badly to take away his pain and make him forget what his own father had put him through. But I know that that's trauma that he'll have to live with forever. I'm just glad he got out of there alive and that his mom doesn't have to spend any more nights without her son. When I was 17, I got my first boyfriend named Alex. I'm a woman for reference. I used to hang out with him every Friday and often on Saturdays too. His parents were super chill. They'd often work weekends and he'd have the house all to himself. Sometimes his parents would be gone overnight, much to my delight. My parents knew I was staying over and they didn't mind too much. They would never let him stay overnight at our house, though. I guess they didn't want certain activity going down under their bone roof, which I understood. One night, we had Alex's house all to ourselves. Alex ordered a pizza for us, and we were cuddling on the couch. The whole day, he'd been super flirty with me, and I was happy to finally be with him. We waited over an hour, though, and our pizza never arrived. I was really starving. So Alex called the pizza place and asked about our order. The person apologized and said the driver was on his way. They apologized again for any inconvenience. Alex got on the couch with me and we both kind of just whined about the late pizza. It finally arrived two hours later. At this point, I was well and truly hangry. Alex answered the door and I heard some commotion. I went into the hallway and I could hear Alex saying something about not giving someone a tip after they were rude. I locked eyes with the pizza guy at the door, and something about his appearance really just unnerved me. He looked to be in his later 20s, and he was scruffy. His demeanor changed from aggressive to surprised when he saw me, but Alex didn't seem to notice. He just said thanks for the food before shutting the door. I asked what happened, and Alex told me the pizza guy had dropped the bag with our pizza and drinks in it right on the ground. He then tutted when Alex picked it up and just kept glaring at him. Alex paid him, but the guy started demanding a tip. That was when Alex said no and told the man he was being so rude he didn't deserve one. I told Alex about the strange way that guy was looking at me, and it just seemed really creepy. Alex told me not to worry too much. Surely we wouldn't be seeing that guy again. We ate in the kitchen, and honestly, it had left our minds rather quickly. After we had dinner, we went to his room, and we were planning on being intimate. We were kissing when I told Alex to make sure that he had locked the front door. He assured me he had, and I took his word for it. We were still kissing when I heard a car from outside. I pulled away and started freaking out, just in case it was Alex's parents. I didn't want them coming back and walking in on us doing the deed. Alex went over to the window, but said that he didn't see anything out there. Well, it felt like every time things were about to escalate, we would hear a weird noise that forced us apart. A second interruption occurred and sounded like someone kicking gravel or stones outside Alex's window. We both heard it, and again Alex looked out but saw nothing. The third interruption was bright car lights shining in through the window. This time we both looked outside, but we still could not find anything out there. When the fourth interruption happened, I actually groaned in frustration. I was so sexually frustrated it was almost painful. I got up and threw Alex's t-shirt on because it was long on me. Then I angrily stormed downstairs. Alex followed behind, but I ignored him. It sounded like someone was pounding on the front door. I went straight to it, unlocking it and about to unleash my full rage. 
When I opened it, to my horror, it was the pizza guy from before. He was standing away from the front door, just idling in the driveway. He was staring at me. It was like he had pounded on the door and then ran backwards to stand in the driveway. Alex came up behind me, and when he saw the pizza guy, he nudged past me and started screaming at him. You know, what the fuck was he doing and why was he still there? The guy just stood there staring at me. I could feel his eyes running up and down my bare legs, and I suddenly felt very uncomfortable. Alex noticed this, and his anger then grew tenfold. He told the pizza guy that he was calling the cops, and he better get off his property or he'd be in big trouble. The guy just continued to stand there, and that's when I had an idea. I told Alex to go grab his dad's gun. The second I said that, the guy snapped and suddenly took off running along the street. We witnessed him jump into his car and then speed off. Alex's dad didn't actually have a gun, but my quick thinking worked, thankfully. Alex slammed a door shut, and we made sure everything was locked up tight. We then called the police and Alex's parents. When the police came, they were utterly useless, though. They told us they'd speak to the restaurant as well as the dude himself, but that he hadn't actually done anything wrong. Alex's parents were on a weekend trip. They wanted to come back then and there, but he persuaded them to wait until the morning. They insisted on cutting their trip short, though, so they were back the very next morning. As you can imagine, that night, the intimate mood was completely ruined. We stayed up for a long time. I managed to doze off, but I don't think he did, because when I woke up, he looked completely exhausted. He reassured me that he'd slept a little bit, but I think he lied to spare me from worrying about him. We found out the pizza guy was fired, too. And that was the last we heard of it. We never ordered a pizza from that place ever again after. Alex would cook for me, or we'd cook something together. We were convinced the pizza guy was going to come back one day. That might sound extreme, but we really wondered if he was bothering other customers the same way he did us and if that was why he was late delivering our food. We'll never know for sure. I'm so glad Alex locked the front door. If he hadn't, maybe that creep would have just let himself in and done God knows what to us. I wonder if he was messing with us out of rage, or maybe he was just a pervert trying to creep on two teenagers. Either way, I'm glad Alex and I protected each other that night. I was 18 and in college, living with my boyfriend in our first apartment. He had left for an early class, and I myself had the day off, so I was taking the opportunity to sleep in a bit. I awoke suddenly, though, to a man I didn't know, sitting at the end of my bed staring at me. When he saw me wake up, he whispered into my ear, It's time to get up now. He just kept looking at me. I was trying to figure out if I was actually awake or if I was dreaming, if there was anything I could do to avoid getting raped and murdered by this stranger. He just kept sitting there, staring at me as if I was some curious creature. I figured out I must surely be awake. I also remembered I had been sleeping naked, so I didn't want to get up unless he made a move. After what felt like a lifetime of silence, he did it again. It's time to get up now. I said okay, still too shocked and scared to figure out what I could do. I didn't ask him who he was or tell him to leave or start screaming for help. He got up and simply walked out of the room, and then I heard voices in my kitchen. He left my bedroom door open when he left, so I still didn't want to get up yet because of the whole naked thing. After a few minutes, I built up the courage to wrap a blanket around myself grabbed some clothes, and dashed to the bathroom. As I passed by the door, I saw him standing in the kitchen doorway, just staring into my room, watching me run for the bathroom. I got dressed and began to quickly make my way towards my cell phone. I had to pass him and my kitchen, where I could hear three male voices in there. As I passed by, I saw that two of the men were in plumber's outfits, and half of my kitchen was soaking wet. It turns out my upstairs neighbor had a burst pipe, and these men were here to fix it. 
they needed access to the problem pipe through my ceiling. The man sitting on my bed was with the realty company and had let them in. He says they knocked, but I never heard it, and no one had called either myself or my boyfriend to say they were coming over. I have no idea why this random guy thought it was okay or appropriate to wake me up while I was naked by staring at me while I was sleeping. He also didn't feel the need to explain who he was or what was going on. Needless to say, we broke our lease and found somewhere else to live after that. This happened during a road trip I was taking, on the way back from seeing my family for the holidays. I'm not usually one to drive for more than a couple of hours, because I much prefer flying myself. This year, though, the tickets to where I was going were way more expensive for some reason. It would have cost me over a thousand bucks for a round-trip flight that only went a few states over. I had planned everything out so I'd get home a few days before I had to go to work again, but a snowstorm blew in on the day I was going to leave, so I had to stay an extra two days before I could finally start driving. The roads were empty since it was past the holiday rush, and most of the drive was pretty out of the way from the big cities and stuff. The hardest part of it really was always staying awake and fighting the boredom. The first eight or so hours went by without much trouble, really. I sure was tired, though, but the snow on the road kept me awake and attentive. It was around 10 p.m., and I had a hotel booked in a small town, just about two hours further ahead. As I kept driving, I noticed a small light coming up in my mirror. It was the headlights of someone behind me, which was actually the first person I'd seen on the road with me in over an hour. Their lights were getting bigger quickly though, showing they were coming up on me really fast. Soon, I could see it was a large van of some sort. This was only a one-lane road, so I couldn't get out of their way even if I wanted to. I figured they would still swerve around me though, given they were going so fast anyway. Once they reached the back of my car, they matched my speed and stayed right behind me. After a few moments, I realized they weren't trying to get around me at all. We drove like that for almost 10 minutes. It was kind of unnerving, being that it was only us on that road. Yet this huge van was just tailing right behind me. It wasn't a normal following distance either. They were so close to me that I couldn't even see their front bumper or their license plate. Maybe I was a bit quick to feel uneasy about it, but an exit came up for a gas station, and I chose to turn off, hoping they would stay on the road, that I could put some distance between us. As I veered off down the ramp, though, they stayed right behind me. I pulled into the gas station and parked at one of the pumps. The van pulled into the pump right behind me. At this point, I didn't know what was happening. Part of me thought this was something bad, but another part of me thought I might just be overreacting. This was the only gas station in the past 30 minutes, so it wasn't that unlikely they would need gas as well. Before I shut my car off, I looked around. The store part of the gas station had its lights out and a closed sign hanging from the door. I looked to the sides of it, seeing nothing but empty darkness. No houses, no buildings, just a field covered in snow, with a single road going through it. I looked in my mirror. A man was now standing outside the van and putting gas in. I got out and began doing the same. As the numbers slowly ticked on the gas meter, the man quickly put his pump back and sealed his gas cap. I looked over, seeing him walking to the back of his van. Then I heard the loud ratcheting sound of the back door being lifted open. There was something in that moment, maybe a gut feeling or just an instinct of some kind. It told me that I needed to get out of there right now. I pulled the pump out of my car, and not even a second later, three men jumped out the back of the van and began sprinting right at me. 
I dropped that pump on the ground and quickly got in my car, locking the doors just as one of them grabbed the handle. He tried to rip it open. I was shaking and moving as quick as I could to get the car on. All three of them surrounded me, trying each door, but then immediately sprinted back to their van before I'd even had the chance to pull away. When I did though, I saw them drive away first, going in the opposite direction, back down the way we had come from. I let the police know what happened, but I never even got a call back with any updates. I think it's obvious they were trying to boduct people under the cover of night on this vast unpopulated highway. What's terrifying is how confident, or for lack of a better word, professional the whole operation seemed. As soon as they realized I was securely in my car, and it wasn't going to be effortless to grab me, they fled immediately, without even needing to communicate with each other. It was like they had done this many times before. What would have happened if they had gotten me? I don't know, but I urge everyone to learn from my mistakes, because you may not be as lucky as I was. This took place in an abandoned house in Gunma Prefecture. Some of you may have heard of this house before. The abandoned house is known as Mannequin's House. It's a very old western-style home. For all I know, it's still standing, but I'll never go back there. A lot of people say that no one should go upstairs in that house. There are two mannequins up there that are so lifelike they feel real. The urban legend is they'll attack and chase anyone who goes up there. This is my experience in the mannequin house. My good friend, let's call him Jay, told me about the mannequin house and said he'd went there once. He claimed he went inside and saw one of the mannequins peeping at him from the top of the stairs. Needless to say, he ran for it. When he told me this story, all it did was make me curious. I wanted to go there and see it for myself. I mean, wouldn't you? It's such an outlandish story. Obviously, Jay said he didn't really want to go there again, but I eventually persuaded him. We had a mutual friend who loved dark stuff like the occult and ghost hunting. We also invited him. We'll call him B. All three of us set off for the mannequin house. Jay wasn't too enthusiastic in the car. But me and the other guy were so excited. It was dark as we arrived at the abandoned house. Thick trees and weeds grew all over the property and its surroundings. I wasn't scared, though. There were residential homes very close by. The neighborhood looked quite different from the areas around it. There were a lot of villa-type homes, like some rich European sort of thing. We headed to the entrance of the house and climbed over the fence, we ignored the keep out and don't enter signs. The door was unlocked. The key was busted in the lock anyway, so you couldn't have locked it even if you wanted to. My friend chimed in. There's no way I'm going to the second floor. As soon as I see a mannequin or anything weird, I'm getting out of here. I said I was going up there. My friend told me there was some thing he read online about a man who went here and managed to get away because he didn't make eye contact with the mannequins upstairs. I was sort of laughing to myself. I'm fine. I've been to tons of dangerous abandoned buildings and so-called haunted places. Not a problem. We went in and began looking around on the first floor of the house. It was in good condition. Wasn't trashed at all. Even though it was pretty dark, we could see it was well kept. Next, the second floor. We approached the stairs. Jay said, I'm waiting here. Fine, wait there then. I'm going up, B said. We began marching up the stairs. I was feeling a bit nervous and on edge actually. All the stories Jay had told me about this place were now swimming around in my head. I started following him up the stairs. He made a sound like he was terrified and I ran back down to the ground floor. Let's get the hell out of here! I bellowed up the stairs. He called back. I just slipped, dude. What's wrong with you? Are you a chicken? I felt a bit ashamed of being so cowardly. It went silent. 
and we began to grow nervous downstairs. We shouted out for B to say something. He let out a startled sound again, but this time he said we needed to get out of there right now. He ran downstairs and said we were leaving right now. He pulled us full speed out of the house. We jumped in the car and we sped away. We went to B's house and went upstairs to his bedroom. He locked the door and pulled the curtains over the windows. I asked what happened up there. He told me he'd indeed seen a mannequin up there. He felt like it was staring at him, and he felt a presence as well. As he looked a bit closer, he noticed that behind the mannequin's face mask were two human eyes. Before he even had a chance to react, the person inside reached out and grabbed his arm. He tugged away and ran for it back down the stairs. As he was telling the story, he was really on the verge of tears. I'd never heard him make such a scared voice like that before. We both stayed over at his house that night to try and calm him down. He was really shaken up. We were about to go to sleep when we heard something outside the window. Some strange noise. They're here. They found me, he said. We told him it was okay. We were here with him. We would keep him safe. The doors and windows were locked. Everything was fine. Honestly, I was quite terrified about the whole situation, but I had to stay calm for his sake. The noises soon went away, and we fell asleep. We had no problems throughout the night, and come morning, Jay drove me home. The whole journey, he kept silent. I thought he was still frightened. As we arrived at his house, he said, I was really shocked by what I saw. What are you talking about? I asked him. He said that as we were leaving, he looked up at the upstairs window and saw handprints all over it. Shortly after this incident, we all lost touch. I tried to reach back out to B, but he would never answer his phone, and I heard he became sort of a recluse. I never saw him again. I like to think that he got some help and moved away maybe, but I'll never go exploring in a place like that again. Okay, this happened many years ago when I was a kid. I was probably about 10 years old or so. I remember that my parents and I would go to my uncle's house sometimes. My uncle lived in a pretty big house on a large property, but he lived way out in the country where there's nothing else around. It was like 40 minutes away from anything, but we had a lot of family gatherings there. Because of the space between the land and the large house, it was the best place for all of us to meet up at once. When we went there, though, I would always be bored out of my mind. All my cousins were much older than I am, so I didn't really have anybody to talk to. One time when we were there, I was so bored I went outside. My uncle had a basketball hoop out behind the house. I was messing around over there. There was also a huge woods in my uncle's yard. I'm not sure if all of it was his property or not, but there was a trail going out into the woods. I got curious and decided to walk down it to see what it was like. I had never been on that trail, but I'd heard about it before. When I first started to walk down it, it was just like any other trail in the woods. It was pretty dense on both sides, and the trail itself was not very wide. I kept walking and several minutes later, I reached an area where the trail was less paved. It seemed like it hadn't really been maintained much. At this point, the grass was longer and there was an option to go either left or right. I went left and kept following down that trail. It was pretty interesting to me because I didn't have a lot of hiking experience. It was also more entertaining for me than just sitting in my uncle's house with nobody to hang out with. I walked down several random trails and turned down several more for the next 20 minutes or so. Around that time, I decided I wanted to head back, except I no longer knew the way it was. That was something I hadn't thought about when I was delving further in. I started to panic a little bit when I realized I had no clue how to get back. I was a kid, and I didn't have a smartphone at age 10, like little kids seem to have nowadays. 
I was all on my own to figure it out. I tried to retrace my steps for the next several minutes. It was during this time when I heard a noise a ways behind me. My first thought was that it was some kind of animal. I was terrified. I was thinking it might be a bear or a mountain lion or something. As I kept walking and trying to go faster, I continued to hear that noise behind me. I looked back, but saw nothing at first. It was too far behind me to see. As I kept walking, I continued to hear the noise a ways back. It sort of sounded like it was getting closer to me, though. I also realized it didn't sound like an animal anymore, but a person instead. That didn't really make me feel much better. I was still scared. Who would be out walking this far into the woods? When I got to a straight point in the path, I looked behind me and briefly caught a glimpse of a man walking in the brush. I didn't know who he was. He was tall and sort of thin. He was also looking down at the ground, so I didn't get a good look at his face. I tried to walk even faster than I already was. I was desperately trying to find my way back to my uncle's house, but I had no clue if I was heading in the right direction. I turned a few times when there were options to in the trails. I'm not sure if my uncle made these trails or if they were animal trails or what, but every time I turned, the guy behind me followed the same way. He was very slowly over time getting closer and closer as well. He was also trying to maintain some distance. When the trail was going around a sharp turn, I took the corner and immediately dashed into the woods. It was very thick at that part, but I didn't know what else to do. I ran in and hid inside a bush. I was laying on the ground and got all kinds of scratched up in the process. I soon heard the man walking. I remember hearing him go off the trail a little bit, and I was nervous he was walking around the area I was in. After that, he moved along though. He remained off the trail, and I'm 90% sure he was looking for me. I soon heard him go further away. Then I stopped hearing him altogether. I kept hiding where I was for a good 10 minutes at least. I was afraid he was still there someplace hiding. When I finally got the courage to leave my hiding spot, I did not see the man. I left and went back to the trail. Problem was, I still had no clue where I was though. I just started walking in the opposite direction the man seemed to have gone. I went for about 10 minutes, just going down the path, when by some miracle, I saw my uncle's yard in the distance. I ran for it and finally made it back. I had probably been gone for an hour or so. After going inside my uncle's house, I found my parents and told them what happened. We then consulted my uncle and asked him who the guy in the woods would be. He said that nobody else should have been back there and that his property went on for many acres. My uncle went out to search and was in the woods for a while. When he came back, he said he didn't find anybody. My uncle said there was really no other property nearby, and that made it even more creepy to me. I was really scared when the man was following me, of course, but I sort of thought that maybe he was a neighbor or something. Maybe I'd accidentally wandered onto someone's property without knowing that I was trespassing, but knowing that there was no one else's property around made it even more scary. After that, I didn't go into my uncle's woods alone anymore. A couple of years ago, I went on my very first hunting trip. My girlfriend's dad and I arrived around midnight, and it was pitch black out there in the country. While he was setting up inside the cabin, I was outside unpacking the truck by myself. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I hear a man's voice coming from the abandoned barn about 50 feet away from me. It was a hushed whisper, as if they were trying to stay undiscovered. Hey, come over here. Psst, come over here. I stopped and looked over in that direction. I pretty much froze in disbelief when I noticed a shadowy figure. Whoever this was then continued. Hey, I said come over here. Come on, I need to show you something. Then they stopped, 
I dropped my stuff and walked calmly into the cabin. I asked my girlfriend's dad how close the nearest property was, and I was told it was an entire mile down the road. After I told him what just happened, he didn't seem to believe me, but just in case he grabbed his gun and called over to that area. He went over to search it, but as he did so, there was no response. We didn't find any hints of that shadowy presence, but needless to say, I was extremely freaked out. My boyfriend Jan and I were staying with two of his friends, Jim and Jeremy. Jeremy had left the apartment an hour or so before Jay and I decided to go to bed. A few minutes after Jay fell asleep, I heard a knock on the door. Jim answered it, and it turned out it was Jeremy. Thing is, Jeremy was not alone. Two guys that also lived in the apartment building had forced Jeremy to knock at the door so they could force their way inside. He didn't have his keys on him. Once they were inside, I could hear what sounded like a scuffle from where I was in the bedroom with the door closed. I woke Jay up, and all of a sudden, we heard unknown voices yelling to get down on the ground. Jay wanted to go and see what was going on, but I begged him to stay in the bedroom with me, which he did. After what seemed like many minutes of arguing and fighting, everything went absolutely silent. We opened the bedroom door, only to see Jim laying on the ground with what we later found to be a machete sticking out of his chest. Jeremy was calling 911. The apartment building didn't have a buzzer to let anyone inside, so when the police got there, Jay had to let them in himself. He showed them to the suite we were in. After that, they separated us all and put the three of us into the back of three different police cars. In the meantime, the paramedics tried to save Jim's life. Unfortunately, they were not able to save him, and he died in that apartment. I knew he was dead when the paramedics wheeled him out to the ambulance, but didn't leave for at least five minutes without continuing to work on him at all. The police took us to be questioned, again keeping us separated the entire time. About 12 hours later, they were ready to let us go, but told us we were not allowed to go back to the apartment as it was currently an active crime scene. We were dropped off by the police at a coffee shop with no money, phones, wallets, or even shoes on our feet as they wouldn't let us take anything from the apartment before they put us in the police cars. We ended up going to a friend's house where we stayed until we were let back into the apartment about four or five days later. Once we were allowed back in, the very first thing I had to do was clean up all the blood, which I'm sure you can imagine was pretty hard to handle. It was a very traumatic experience overall. Hi y'all, I'm writing this here because it happened over a year ago now, and nothing has come of it since. I wanted to share it somewhere because I never really told anyone about it outside of some really close friends. I live in a really small town, so I've never felt unsafe being alone or anything like that. I'm 18 years old and female to male transitioning. I felt a lot more comfortable in people not approaching me or being creepy since I passed quite well. Over the summer, I had started getting into the habit of going on walks as a way to get some exercise in and listen to a long podcast I'd just started. The issue was, I hate crossing streets, and I feel like I'm being judged or watched by people in cars when I wait by crosswalks. I'm a really paranoid person. Because of this, I started going on these walks at night when less people were out and about. Since it was summer, it didn't really get dark until 9pm or so, so I'd usually walk from 10pm to midnight. When I first started, I didn't really have a set walking path. I would just wander down random streets for the fun of it, until I eventually looped around and found my way back home. After about a month or so, though, 
I settled on a path that I'd usually loop twice to get seven or eight miles in. It took me across a few bridges and main streets, but mostly neighborhoods with minimal street lamps and a couple of parking lots as well. I tried to avoid the busier streets. It was around maybe the two-month mark when I started feeling paranoid out of nowhere. Mind you, like I mentioned, I'm already a paranoid guy. I just for some reason assumed someone's watching me on the street, in the store, through a window. I think part of it comes from worrying people will look at me and somehow discover I'm trans from a glance. But when I started feeling like I was being watched on all my night walks, I assumed it was just the paranoia finally catching up to me. Surely I would get used to it eventually, but this time my paranoia was actually grounded in something. I started to notice what looked like the exact same guy almost every night walking my path at the same time. He always seemed to be about a street or two ahead of me. Because he was ahead of me and not behind me, sometimes I felt like I was the one being creepy and following him. I had been walking this path for a few months now, so I knew that wasn't the case, obviously. But for a while, I was worried this guy thought I might be following him and freak out on me or something. After a week or two of me feeling quite strange about this arrangement, it really blew up in my face. It caused me to totally freak out, though. This night, he was ahead of me as usual, but I took a turn I didn't usually take. I lost him for a couple of streets and didn't really think too much of it. I continued on but decided to divert from my normal path even further and stopped by a store to grab a drink. I didn't do this too often because I had a habit of buying too much snacks whenever I did so. After going in and wandering around for a bit, I noticed that that guy who I'd seen in the past two weeks was also in the store with me. I knew it was him because he always wore this puffy blue coat that seemed way too heavy for the temperature. He also had one of those blue medical masks everyone bought in bulk in 2020. I didn't really think that much of it though. I just thought, hey, there's that guy I've been following. That's a funny coincidence, huh? After wandering around a bit more, I grabbed all my stuff and left, having to take some darker streets I normally wouldn't because of where the store was situated. I immediately noticed the guy had followed out right behind me and was sticking way too close for my liking. I distinctly remember not seeing him buy anything or even holding anything earlier. My paranoia was going crazy, so I started picking up the pace a bit. I turned down my headphone volume because I usually had it on max. When I did, I heard he was calling out to me, saying stuff like, Wait up, little lady! Can't you stop for just a moment? I was so taken aback for being mistaken for a lady for the first time in forever that I did stop. I passed really well, and very rarely would I get mistaken for a woman, but at that time I was letting my hair grow out a bit. I could see how in the dark I might look like a girl. I'm just standing there kind of flabbergasted. He runs right up on me and asks why I was ignoring him. I told him, sorry, my headphones were too loud. What do you want? He immediately backed away. I guess my deep voice from testosterone shots really off-put him. He looked at me weird. Instead of responding, he mumbled something about thinking I was someone else and how he was sorry about the mistake. He ran off into the darkness. It wasn't until the next day that I really sat down and connected the dots of what was going on there and what had almost happened to me. I took a break from my night walks for about half a week or so. When I started again, mysteriously, the man was now nowhere to be seen. Since I never saw his face and barely spoke to him, I couldn't really report much information on him to anyone, so in the end, I just kind of had to let it go. Apologies in advance if I mispronounce any of the names in this next story. In February of 2003, I was renting out a room in a high-rise building in Daegu, South Korea. I was awoken just after 10 a.m. 
from the sound of wailing sirens. I looked out my window, only to see smoke billowing from the entrance of the Jungongno station. It was not a minuscule amount of smoke either. It was like someone had lit the contents of a trash can on fire. There was a solid wall of smoke escaping from the underground chamber. It was so thick that you could barely see through it. After watching the street below turn into a parking lot of emergency vehicles, the alarm in my building went off, ordering us all to evacuate. I exited the building, but I had no idea where to go. The smoke was so thick, and every direction was packed with people panicking, trying to run away on foot. I remember ducking back into the building and crouching in the entryway, keeping my face low to the ground and breathing the fresh air being pumped in through the air conditioning vents. I stayed there for a good few hours, unwilling to venture out onto the street for fear of being trampled or suffocated in that horrifying haze. I was also too afraid to move any deeper into the building, just in case it caught fire as well. I had no idea what was going on. The only thing I could think of was that maybe a bomb had gone off. Without access to a phone, all I could do was wait, with a thousand questions running through my mind and screams ringing through the air. I could only hope this nightmare would end soon. The smoke eventually cleared, but when it did, the screaming outside only intensified. I wandered out into the street in a daze. Firefighters with oxygen masks on, frantically gesturing at each other. It looked like I had just washed up on the shores of Pompeii, directly after the eruption. I knew in that moment things would never be the same again. It wasn't until nearly a week later, though, that I learned the full story of what occurred just a short distance away from me. A 56-year-old unemployed man named Kim Dae-han had boarded a train at Daegu Station earlier that morning with the intent to set the train on fire and burn the passengers inside alive. Han suffered from depression as a result of a stroke he'd had two years prior, which left him partially paralyzed. He later told the police that he wished to take his own life but in a manner that he would take hundreds of others with him so his pain would always be remembered. He was spotted on camera, carrying a duffel bag into the train station, which contained cartons of flammable liquid. Once the train was in motion, he opened the bag and began pouring the liquid out. When other passengers saw him fiddling with his lighter, they rushed him in an attempt to stop him, but ultimately they failed. Fire erupted in the train car. When the doors opened at the next station, Han and several other passengers managed to escape. Some were still in the fire, though. Once the train stopped, the fire quickly began to spread to all six cars. There was so much smoke down in that platform that none of the cameras could even see what was happening. Another train heading in the opposite direction was warned to proceed with caution but was not instructed to stop upon arriving at the station. The train came to a halt right next to the burning subway cars. The conductor was not sure what to do. The power failed at the station, which stopped the train from leaving, and while the conductor frantically tried to call for help over his radio, he eventually panicked and abandoned the train, leaving the passengers trapped inside. There were no fire extinguishers on board, and no water sprinklers on the subway platforms. The smoke was too thick for emergency responders to reach the train for several hours. It was still the early morning rush hour then. Over 190 people, men, women, and children, all died. Kim Dae-han himself was eventually found in the hospital, being treated for burns. On August 5th of 2003, he was sentenced to life in prison where he died just over a year later. The conductor of the second train was also arrested for criminal negligence. There were six other members of the Metropolitan Subway Corporation that were arrested as well. And that's my story of how I was practically right next to one of the worst mass murders in history. I left the city soon after and tried to cherish every day as another gift, abundant with possibilities.
I grew up in the South in the late 70s and early 80s. My grandmother lived on a cotton farm in South Carolina, and my cousin and I would go visit her during the summer. We would help out around the farm, but during the heat of the day we would go swimming in the river to cool off a bit. Our favorite spot was fairly isolated, so we never really saw anyone else. There was this old dirt road that ran from the gravel road back to an abandoned farmhouse in the woods. My cousin and I were in the river when we saw a cloud of dust in the distance. We thought that maybe our uncle was coming to take us back to the farm, but we always swam for an hour or so after lunch, and he'd never driven the tractor to come and get us before. We'd heard stories about some backwoods family that had gone all deliverance on some kids a few summers ago, but we figured that just had to be our uncle trying to freak us out. Regardless, we snuck up to the riverbank, so we could see the dirt road but would still be hidden in the trees. We saw this ratty Oldsmobile Delta 88 with blacked out windows creeping down the dirt road. The car didn't belong to anyone we knew. I only really remember the make and model because I knew it was the evil dead car and because of what happened next. After it passed by our hiding spot, we noticed it didn't have any license plates. It drove another 30 yards or so, then stopped for a moment. I remember a black garbage bag flying out of the passenger window and out into the field. Then the car made a slow and methodical three-point turn, taking great pains not to let the tires venture too far into the cotton field. It made its way back the direction it came from until it disappeared out of sight. My cousin and I remained silent throughout this event, and with the car gone now, we looked at each other in confusion. I really wish we would have just ignored it. I wish we would have headed back to the farm. I wish we would have told our uncle or our grandmother what we had seen, and had them come investigate instead. But we were only 13, and the curiosity was killing us. We had to go check out that bag. As we left our hiding place and headed down the road, we looked around nervously hoping the car would not show up again. As we got close to the drop zone, we could see blood on some of the cotton, directly above the bag's resting place. We could see blood all over the bag as well. We looked at each other one last time, and then we ran away. Over the years, I've thought a lot about what might have been inside that bag. A part of me is glad we didn't decide to open it, but I don't know. My curiosity will never go away, and it's haunted me ever since then. I was out in the middle of nowhere at a musical conference. My wife was presenting, and it was being held at an old church retreat camp. One of her presentations ran way over time, so the lodge's cafeteria was already closed by the time she finished. With no car, no phone, this area was so remote there was no coverage for mobile, and no vending machines. The only recourse was to walk to the nearest town and grab some food. I grabbed a coat and flashlight and had no issue on the trip down. I snagged a pizza from a spot along the highway at around midnight or so. On the way back, though, it was a much different story. I got this severe feeling of discomfort. I could feel eyes on me. This was out in the middle of the woods, so my first instinct was that there must be some wild animal following me. Knowing that most predators like to hit from either above or behind, I turned on my phone light and kept it pointed behind me. I swept my flashlight up and down as I walked. The whole walk I could hear rustlings, first along one side, then following directly behind. I kept a steady pace and acted cool, even though I was completely terrified. Shortly before I was back on sight, the feeling left and there were no further sounds. My wife and I enjoyed our pizza and slept in that night. Two days later, though, we got the shock of our life from the news. 
A homeless woman had been found less than 1,500 yards from our site. She had been mauled and eaten in what appeared to be a cougar attack. The area she was killed and the estimates of the time of death put me in that same area on the night that I went out to get a pizza. A few years ago, my best friend and I went to Adams Morgan, a strip of bars, clubs, etc. in D.C. It was a Saturday night, so the whole area was packed up with people. We ended up having to park several blocks away, in some random back alley. As we were walking down the alleyway, I turned around and noticed a man with a backpack several yards behind us. I didn't really think much of this, and just kept walking, minding my own business. A few seconds later, though, I looked behind us again and saw he was now a lot closer. I started to speed walk forward. When I looked again, though, the man was now sprinting full speed right towards us. I grabbed my best friend's hand and started to bolt. We started running full speed down this alley, with this guy chasing right behind us. We ended up running into the busy DC traffic and nearly getting hit by multiple cars. It was almost like a scene out of a movie. We somehow made it across the busy six-lane street unscathed and watched the man from across the street, menacingly staring us down for a moment before turning away and running back up the alley. To this day, we still have no idea what that was about. This happened just a couple weeks ago on a Friday. I had two friends in my car. We were coming back from a restaurant to celebrate finishing up the school play. I'd just dropped the first friend off and was now making the four to five mile drive to my second friend's home. It was down a narrow road that cut through some pretty dense woodlands. She was in the front seat and we were listening to some ballads, just talking about life. It was nothing too out of the ordinary. I was driving behind a deep red pickup truck that had a motorcycle stored in the bed. I wasn't tailgating them or anything, even though the driver was going a bit slow for my taste and swerving around just a tad too much. I was about to reach this intersection that's not even a block away from my second friend's home when the guy suddenly pulled over for no reason. He just pulled over to the side of the road, about one or two car lengths from the blinking red light. As I passed him to stop up ahead, I saw his face. He was pretty generic looking, like any guy you'd see out walking on the street, but for some reason, he was staring right at us with fury in his eyes. He was so angry that it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and I sensed something was not right here. My friend looked out the window and asked me, What is he doing? I looked at my rearview mirror, only to see the man getting out of his seat and pulling a ski mask over his face. He was wielding a huge, I'd say 10-inch, knife in his hand. He started sprinting towards our car, almost reaching the passenger side. I screamed and slammed on the gas, driving around for a while. To my surprise, I could still see the man trying to chase my car for a few blocks until he knew he was not going to catch us on foot. I went down a few random roads to lose him, and when I got back to the intersection a few minutes later to finally drop my friend off, the man seemed to be long gone. My friend ran inside as soon as I let her out and locked her doors. I sped away from the area, but it was surely terrifying. I told the police and filled out a report as well. I don't think I'll ever be crossing that intersection if I can help it again. My parents were out one night, and my brother and I were home alone. We were probably 10 and 12 years old at that time. I remember there was a knock at the front door, and I heard a voice call out, Pizza's here! 
I remember initially thinking it was my father playing a joke on us. I instinctively went to open the door, when suddenly it hit me. That wasn't my dad's voice, and we didn't order any pizza either. I said so out loud through the door. There was no reply, and no audible movement either. I went to my bathroom window, which allowed some vision of the footpath leading to the front of our property and to the front door. You couldn't see the door itself, though. Me and my brother waited for about 15 minutes, grabbing a baseball bat and some ornamental fireplace pokers, until eventually we saw the guy move away from the door and walk away. It was just some random guy with dark hair and a ponytail. He had a big dark coat on and was covering his face with a mask. There was no pizza in his hands either. One night, when I was about seven years old, I went to sleep at around 9.30 and got into the second level of my bunk bed. I soon fell asleep, but I was woken up in the middle of the night to what sounded like someone whispering no repeatedly, as if they were in some deep pain. Thinking I just imagined it, I tried to go back to sleep, but that's when I began to hear the creaking of the wooden boards on the stairs, slowly getting louder, and that whisper getting louder as well. I knew it couldn't be my parents, because they were sleeping in the bed next to mine. Then I heard someone screaming, along with footsteps coming up the stairs, and again the whispering of no over and over. I slowly got out of bed and crept toward the ladder to get to the floor. I began to crawl towards the bedroom door in the dark, which had a full view of the stairs. I saw nothing moving in the dark nooks of the stairs, but now I heard the whisper coming from a room upstairs which nobody used. I silently crept toward the stairs, but I kept the lights off and began to creep down them so I could check the front door. Nothing seemed to be out of place. I turned on the living room lights, and that's when I saw it for an instant, the silhouette of three people outside the living room window. As soon as I'd seen them, though, they already fled. I proceeded to turn on every light in the house and wake up my parents to check all the rooms. We didn't find any evidence of anyone inside. I waited for it to be morning so we could check even further, but there was no evidence of anyone having been inside our house. It was such a strange and frightening occurrence. I was 25 and decided to take a trip into the city after my mom's passing. She died very unexpectedly, and I still lived with her at the time, so I really needed to get out of that house. Everything inside of it reminded me of her. I chose a hotel that had relatively good reviews, and the price for the room was way too good to pass up. I won't reveal the hotel's name for obvious reasons, the main one being I'm trying to forget this experience altogether, and even typing out its name is hard for me. The hotel had an old world charm to it that instantly drew me in. As I checked in, I couldn't help but admire how clean everything was. It was the kind of place that you see in the postcards, and I was looking forward to getting my room, and finally being able to relax after everything I'd been through that month. My room was on the second floor, and it was nice to see that it had a good view of the garden. The hotel staff was friendly, and everything seemed perfect. It all started innocently enough. On the first night, I went down to the hotel's restaurant for dinner, as I sat alone at the corner table, I noticed a man at the bar. He was tall with messy hair and a pretty scruffy beard. He seemed to be in his 40s or so and was wearing a faded leather jacket and jeans. I don't know why I remember what he was wearing so well, but I do know I caught his eye for a moment and he gave me a nod. I'm a pretty awkward person, so I just looked away and pretended like I hadn't seen anything. The night went on and I tried not to think too much about it, 
After dinner, I returned to my room and settled in for the night. I watched some TV, read a book, and eventually fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, though, things felt a little off. As I stepped out of my room and made my way towards the elevator, I noticed the exact same man from the night before. He was just leaning against the wall a few feet away from my room. His eyes immediately locked onto me, and it sent a shiver down my spine. It was not the good kind. I tried to shake off this uneasy feeling that I was getting, thinking it must all be a coincidence, but that voice in my head was telling me that something was off here. I should have listened to it. I decided to try and go about my day without being too paranoid, but being a woman all by myself and fairly small, paranoia is a bit of a requirement. I wanted to see the sights and explore the city, but no matter where I would go, I had this eerie feeling that someone was following me. I just couldn't escape the feeling of being watched. That night, I got back to the hotel and decided to have dinner in that restaurant again. I really didn't want to run into that dude once more, but the convenience of eating and being able to go straight up to your room was just way too tempting to pass up. I also hoped that being around other people would ease my nerves. As I sat down at my table, the same man walked in once again and sat down at the bar. This time he was a bit closer though and he was facing me. He had a drink in his hand and was staring at me very intently. I tried not to look at him, but when someone is staring at you so hard and won't stop or even blink when you look back at them, you can't help but take a peek every so often to see if they're continuing to do so. After a short while, his face changed into a sort of smile that thoroughly creeped me out. I got up to leave and noticed he got up at the same time and began walking out after me. He was eerily close behind me as he did so. I swear, I could almost feel him breathing on the back of my neck as we walked. I tried asking the man nicely to stand a bit further back, but he just started to laugh. He followed me all the way up to my floor and stopped a few doors down from my room. I entered my room quickly, glancing back at him, and I noticed he was doing the same thing as before just leaning against the wall clearly waiting for me, or waiting to do something to me, all without saying a single word. I knew I probably shouldn't ignore it anymore. I was scared and confused. I decided to approach the hotel staff about the situation first, before I went so far as to just call the police. The man hadn't actually done anything to physically harm me, so I doubt there was anything they would have been able to do anyway. I explained my discomfort and the fact I had seen the man loitering near my room multiple times and he seemed to be following me. They were understanding and assured me they would keep an eye on things. For the next couple of days, I stayed close to the hotel and inside my room for the most part. I even considered cutting my trip short, but I didn't want to let fear dictate my choices. This was supposed to be my time to heal and I didn't want to let some weirdo ruin that. As a person traveling alone, I was determined to reclaim my sense of security. Unfortunately, every day I was there, I saw that guy. Sometimes he would be waiting in the lobby, other times in the hallway, or other times right outside my room. Occasionally, he would be at the restaurant. He even managed to show up at the gym the few times I'd randomly decided to work out. It was as if he was playing some twisted game of cat and mouse with me. I became increasingly paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder and wondering when and where he'd appear next. One night after I'd been there for about a week, I returned to my room after dinner and was shocked to find a note had been slipped under the door. The handwriting almost looked like it was hurried and barely legible. All it said was, I was watching you. My heart raced as I read that note over and over again. I knew it had to have come from him. I immediately called the front desk and reported the note to staff, who told me they were taking the situation very seriously. They advised me to lock my door, stay in the room, and wait for them to check the security tapes. They assured me they'd find the man and get police involved if necessary. I sat in my room, waiting anxiously for anyone to tell me the man had been kicked out 
or even that he'd been arrested. That I'd be okay somehow. Minutes turned into hours, and the sense of dread only intensified. What if the staff couldn't find the guy? What if he was waiting for me somewhere in the hotel? What if he was in my room? I just didn't know. It almost felt like I was being hunted. Finally, a knock at my door broke the silence. It was the hotel manager, along with the security guard. They informed me they had found the man, who was in the process of being escorted off the premises. They assured me that he would not be allowed back into the hotel, and that they were involving the police to be sure all necessary steps were being taken to resolve the issue. I was relieved, but still a bit shaken up. I thanked the hotel staff for their quick response, and for believing me when I told them something was wrong. I was later contacted by a detective who informed me the man had been arrested after they found many pictures of me in his coat pockets. It turned out the man had been stalking me for almost a year without me ever knowing. They investigated his apartment and it was filled with pictures of me out on town, pictures of me doing everyday things. There were even candid shots of me at my mother's funeral, pictures of me in my house taken through my windows. I have no idea how I never noticed that someone was constantly following me. I guess realizing when I did, before he tried to do anything to hurt me, was better than realizing too late. He was charged with aggravated stalking. Looking back, this experience taught me the importance of trusting my instincts and taking action when I feel unsafe. I'm a 22-year-old woman who currently lives with my family, along with my current partner. I'm going to be keeping his name anonymous for privacy reasons. I had just come home late from work. It was about midnight or so when I had gotten home, and my family was already asleep. My boyfriend was still awake and waiting for me, though. After getting out of my work clothes and into my PJs, him and I were relaxing with our cat, when she started crying about wanting to go outside. I couldn't let her out the back door though, since I'd heard some dogs outside. It was about 2 a.m. or so. She just kept yapping and pawing at the door, so I decided to let her out the front door instead. She's an indoor and an outdoor cat. She only goes outside a few times a week though. She mostly likes to socialize with other cats or just roam around. I had opened the front door and walked out with her for a brief minute. As she walked out, I noticed she was staring out at the street behind our cars, out of the neighboring street. She kept walking, but then bolted the other way. I suddenly heard this weird grunting. I looked over and saw a figure of a man who I didn't know. He was dirty with messy hair, and he just wore a pair of jeans and a brown jacket. I saw him start approaching the door, and without saying anything, I started to back away, still facing him. As I reached the doorway, I noticed he began to walk a little faster toward me. I got inside just in time, and locked the door behind me. I then heard what I imagined was him trying to open it. The doorknob wiggled violently, then it went quiet. I could still hear some shuffling from outside. Luckily, I had my phone on me so I texted my boyfriend and told him what was going on. I then called my mom, waking her up, because I wasn't sure if her window was open that night, since her room was at the front of the house. This was way before we had any guns in the home, mind you. This happened to be occurring on the one night my father was out of town for a work project. After my mom woke up, she came out into the living room, and since we were both there, we felt it was safe to check out the window. We could see that the guy was still there. My mom jumped back away from the window, as I guess the man had made eye contact with her. We then saw a silhouette as the man began trying to peek into the house. He still wasn't saying anything, just mumbling and pacing around our door. My boyfriend came out with whatever he could find to use as a weapon, just in case it was needed. My mom called the police, explaining what I had told her, as well as what she had just experienced. The man was trying his best to peer inside our house. The cops then said they were sending out a patrol car to us. 
By the time the cops got to our house, though, the guy had managed to leave without making a sound. The cops showed up, and I gave them a full description of the man, and told them anything I could remember. They decided to drive around a bit to see if they could find the man, down the street or anywhere in between, maybe even hiding around the outer areas of the house. It was all clear, thankfully. There were no other issues or anything going on that night, nor did the man ever come back. My cat eventually returned when they felt like it. I know this may not be that scary to a lot of you, but it was for me. I have my cat to thank, really, because I don't think I would have even realized there was a person there since it was so dark, and I didn't see him or even become aware of him until I was already headed back into the house. All I can say is stay safe out there and try to be aware of your surroundings. We've also gotten a new litter box and some toys, so my cat doesn't feel the need to wander out so much. I think it's much safer that way. In 2019, I did deliveries for a pizza place near my school. I'd work most days after class, so I could afford to pay for my car and rent. It wasn't a great job in any aspect, but it was good enough to get me through college without being completely broke. This night was no different than most in the beginning. I clocked in at 6 o'clock and delivered for three hours straight. Then I took my lunch break and started again at 9.30. I picked up the next order and started heading to the place. The address didn't look like a house, and the route it took me on to get there was not what I was expecting. It took me further out from town, away from most houses and stores, into this business center. It was an area full of small office buildings and absolutely nothing else. I drove down the road and couldn't really tell what any of the addresses were. I just followed the directions on the GPS and hoped it would take me into the right parking lot. When I turned, I drove in through a pretty long parking area until I reached the front of the building and could finally read the address. It matched up with the one on the order, but something was wrong here. The parking lot was completely empty, not even the street lights were on, and the office building had no signs of anyone being inside. I double-checked the address, thinking there must have surely been some sort of mistake, but everything checked out. I even tried searching it on Google for any places nearby with the same address, but no, this was it. I set my car in park and got out, glancing around before walking up to the door. It was a glass door with a dark tint covering it. I knocked and then took a step back and waited. It only took a moment before the door opened. There was a middle-aged man there, wearing some very casual clothes and holding a strange grin on his face. He was almost overly excited. He said he was so happy the food had finally arrived and that everyone was so hungry. I looked behind him, not seeing anyone else inside. Not seeing anyone else inside. There was only a single light on in the middle of the hallway but I ignored everything and just told the man his total. He must have realized what I was looking for, though, as he quickly explained that everyone else was in the rec room on the third floor for a company party. I smiled to be polite, but the man was talking with an eerie amount of excitement, so much so that I was sure the man was faking it. He pulled out his wallet and handed me the cash for the pizzas, along with a $10 tip. As I took the money, though, he said that he needed a favor real quick. He wanted me to help bring the pizzas up to the third floor. The man had put me in a strange position. Having taken the generous tip already, it felt like it would only be right to help him. On the other hand, though, carrying a few pizzas is not exactly difficult, and it didn't seem necessary by any means. He started walking without me having answered, yet urged me to follow him. He made his way to a door leading to some stairs. I trailed behind, keeping my distance, but followed him into the stairwell. As I entered, though, I felt a cold rush of air and noticed that all of the lights were off. 
Only the small light from the hallway lit the entrance to the stairs. The man started making his way up, but stopped once he realized I hadn't continued following him. He turned and made some humorous remark about the lights, but his grin was quick to leave once he saw I was not going to follow him anymore. There was no hesitation, as he came rushing down toward me with anger in his eyes. I tossed the pizzas on the ground and rushed out the door into the hallway. I then ran for the exit and bolted to my car. I saw the man come partly out the front doors. Before going back in and slamming them shut, I immediately called the police after driving to a different parking lot. The man had run off by the time they got there. Since he'd paid in cash, there was no way to know who he really was. The office building was completely empty though, and there was nobody else on the third floor unsurprisingly. It was clear this was some sort of trap. What he had ready for me on that third floor is unknown, and I hope that nobody ever has to know. This happened when I was a high school student during the summer holidays. My friends and I wanted to make some memories, so we decided to have a barbecue. We set up our barbecue in a field. One of my friends mentioned that there was an abandoned hospital nearby. Because I'd never been ghost hunting or anything like that, he asked if I was up for checking out the abandoned hospital. We were all pumped up for some late night urban exploration. We went to inspect the place at around 11 p.m. I don't know how long ago the hospital was built, but it was really old, and it was practically crumbling down in some places. We approached the entrance cautiously, and my friend told us, Hey guys, it's easy if we go in a big group, but that's so boring. Let's split up a bit. We split up into two groups of three. The first group were ready to go in. Then, after a little while... The second group was set to go in as well. I was in the first group. The atmosphere even in the entrance was so heavy. I don't know if you know what I mean. My heart was thundering in my chest. We tried to open the doors, but it seemed they were locked. I thought that maybe we could break the door down if we tried, but the other lads didn't fancy that. I decided to look around the perimeter for a weak spot to gain access. I found that one of the walls had collapsed around the back side, and I could see inside the building. I let the others in my group know, and we decided to go in. It was really humid in there. The air was moist and damp. It was the usual stuff you would expect to find in an abandoned hospital. Some syringes, some random equipment. The walls were covered in scribblings, and they didn't really make much sense. There were beds as well in the hallways, and something was placed on top of one of these beds, some twisted shape beneath a black cloth. It really creeped me out. I also noticed that someone had strewn origami cranes around the place. I thought about why they might be there. Maybe someone had put there for some reason I didn't understand. Needless to say, it was extremely weird. We crept through even further into the property until we came upon a room with a closed door. I pushed it open, and that's when we saw it. There was this strange doll in front of something resembling an altar. It looked like a crude offering. The doll was quite big and was tattered and raggedy. We went closer to it. None of us wanted to be the one to chicken out and say, let's get out of here but I could tell my friends all wanted to get out of there just as much as I did. There was this cup in front of the doll, and there were some leaves in the cup, as well as a green plate with some black, bad-smelling thing on it. I looked into the doll's eyes. In that moment, I felt a fear of terror for some reason. I knew we had to get out of there immediately. We went back to the barbecue area and started to pack all our things away. I called one of my friends in the second group to see how they were getting on back at the barbecue. When we got back, my friends and I didn't say anything for a while. That was until one of them piped up. Man, that altar was really weird and messed up, huh? I really hated it. It gave me such a weird feeling. I replied that it looked like an offering of some kind. When we discussed our findings, we all saw the doll in the first group, 
but apparently the second group had also gone in for a moment and no one saw the doll. We wondered if in some of the other rooms there might be some other weird offerings or altars. It was honestly the strangest place I'd ever been in. The next week, all three of us who saw that strange doll ended up with an injury. I broke my finger in P.E., my friend got into a moped accident and broke his toe, and my other friend got into an accident as well. He was in the hospital for days. A teacher asked us while laughing, What's happened to you three? Were you cursed or something? Now, I don't know if I believe in curses myself, but it certainly seemed like no laughing matter after such an eerie occult experience. Even to this day, that abandoned hospital still stands. It hasn't been demolished yet, but a sign that reads Keep Out has since been put up, and a large metal fence surrounds it as well. One thing's for sure. I don't think I'll be looking around in there anytime soon. This happened just last year. I was driving home and making a relatively long drive. It was going to take me about four hours. I was also driving a majority of it at night. I had the directions on my phone and had it in my phone holder right in front of me and slightly to the right. As I was driving at night, I was listening to lots of music and not really paying attention. I had been driving on one really long highway for over an hour. In the process, I accidentally missed the exit I was supposed to take that would have led me onto another highway. Instead, I was going in the wrong direction for about 30 minutes. When I finally realized my mistake, the directions were telling me to get off the highway. I then had to take a bunch of back roads to connect to the proper one that I needed to go on. This was supposed to be the shortest route, but it was going through seemingly the middle of nowhere. By this time, the roads were obviously extremely dark and quiet. I didn't see any other cars out on the roads. It was particularly quiet. I was going pretty slow, and after driving on that road for about a mile, my directions told me to turn left. After making the turn, I instantly saw somebody lying on the road up ahead. It appeared to be a man laying on his side, facing away from my vehicle. That was a strange sight indeed. Right away, I was suspicious of this. He was like directly in the middle of the road and was blocking anyone from being able to go past. The man wasn't moving. I just wanted to get out of there, but the possibility the man might actually need help rung in my mind. I stopped my car a ways back from him. On one side of me was some woods, and on the other side was a grassy area with a few trees here and there. There was hardly any light at all aside from my car's headlights. As my car was sitting there on the road, I wanted to see if the man was okay, but I also didn't want to get out either. I rolled down my window and yelled out, asking if the man was alright. He didn't move or say anything. I then decided to call the police. I took my phone out from the holder and started to dial 911. As I was looking down at my phone and doing so though, something caught the corner of my eye. I looked over and saw a man emerging from the woods and going right towards my car. When I saw this, I then saw the man who had been lying on the road start to get up. It was a trap. I knew it. I put my car into reverse and floored it. I started reversing and moving away from these guys. Obviously, I was not well versed in moving away at high speeds in reverse. I wasn't really going that fast and it was kind of hard to control my car going backwards. I couldn't really see where I was going either. The men were both chasing after me, and they were almost catching up. When I made it back to the turn that I had come around, I put a distance between us and then slammed on my brakes and turned. I was then facing the direction of a new road. The men almost caught up to me when I was stopped for a second, but I was able to drive away just before they reached me. I got out of there and then called the police when I was a distance away from them. I gave the exact location of where the incident occurred. Then I took another route to where I needed to go. 
I hope that the police found those guys, or they didn't try whatever it was someplace else. I made it back home a little later than I'd hoped that night, but at least I made it back safe and sound, and that's what matters. When I was in middle school, I took the city bus to my school because my parents couldn't drive me and no school buses routed to my neighborhood. I didn't live in a particularly good place, but I never really felt unsafe either, probably because I was just a kid and thought myself invincible. That morning, I got on the bus to go to school. I was in sixth grade at the time, so I was about 12 years old. Let me tell you though, I've always looked much younger than my age. It was decently crowded inside, so I went to my usual spot right in the back. A few stops went by when a man got on and sat right next to me. It's been about 10 years now, but I still remember how that man looked. He was tall, thin, with long, straight black hair. There were maybe one or two seats open, so it wasn't that weird that he'd sat right down next to me. At first, I just figured he sat in the first available seat he saw open. Then, though, he started to talk to me. I can't really remember what he was saying at first. Being early in the morning and already pissed I had to share my space with him, I just sort of made vaguely disinterested noises at him. He then asked where I was going. That's when my spidey senses started to tingle. Obviously, it was early in the morning, and I was a child. Where else could I be going other than to school? I said school in a duh kind of way. I realized now he was probably looking for me to tell him which school. A few stops went by, and the bus opened up more. I went and found another empty seat. Not five minutes later, he followed and plopped down right next to me. He still tried to get me to talk to him. He asked me my name as well. I looked to the front of the bus and saw some 8th graders that I was familiar with from school and from riding this bus. My animal brain screamed at me to find safety within the pack, so I moved up to the front of my bus and planted myself right into the middle of them. I basically pressed myself right into them and gave them the big help me eyes. The guy moved again and sat directly in front of me. He asked my name once more. One of the boys I was sitting with, named G, quickly called me by a fake name and turned his body so he was kind of shielding me. He carried on a conversation with me until we got to our school. The group of 8th graders basically formed a circle around me and we huddled off the bus together. I turned to make sure the creep didn't follow us off the bus and thankfully he did not. For the next few weeks though, I always caught the earlier or later bus just in case he was on it again. Since the bus stop was right in front of my school, I was afraid he would know where I went and would show up there to find me, but I never saw that guy again. I'm extremely grateful those kids were there to help me. I don't know if that guy might have thought I was younger than I looked, or maybe he thought I was just young and stupid enough to trust him with personal information. Either way, I'm glad he didn't get to do whatever he was planning. This happened six years ago, on the last day of August. I had just come back from spending the summer at my home and was gearing up for another year of school. My girlfriend and I drove back from the airport and were coming into the student complex where we lived. Standing outside smoking was this man, Toby. Neither of us liked Toby very much. He'd been living in the downstairs apartments last year and had been really creepy to one of our floor mates named Sarah. So creepy, in fact, that he had to be banned from the upper floors entirely. We mostly were able to ignore him after that. Toby, however, never let a chance to socialize pass him by, so he said hello and told us we couldn't get inside because the doorknob was missing. It was quite strange, but the building was only renovated into a student complex the year before, and it was kind of a trashy place, so the doorknob being missing was not something unheard of. 
I looked around for it and put the doorknob back on. Toby wandered down toward the end of the walkway to yell obscenities down the street at someone. That was a bit worrying. Even though Toby was kind of creepy, he'd never been a violent or overly aggressive sort of person. He was more subtle in his ways. We slipped inside, thinking that he must have been drunk. We settled in to go to bed, since my plane had gotten in late, and it was around midnight or so. We tried to sleep, but it turned out that was impossible. For whatever reason, Toby was in a rage outside. He was yelling and screaming. He kept coming in and out of the home, banging doors and stomping around. Now, most people had moved out at the end of the year, and we were not even sure if Toby still lived there anymore. We decided, you know, whatever, he'll tire himself out eventually, and it's not like he's hurting anyone. We just tried our best to ignore it. About an hour and a half later, though, Toby was still in a furious rage. Now he was outside our window, though. We were on the side of the building that's next to the other building. The building next door was when they were turning into more student complexes. Toby was banging against the chain link fence, swearing about his house or something, right outside our window. At this point, my girlfriend and I were becoming concerned for our safety. The yelling and banging were getting more and more violent and showed absolutely no signs of stopping. We went and made sure the doors were locked and called the police just in case. The police took a while to arrive, but they arrested Toby for disturbing the peace. They had a talk with him to tell him to quiet down and go to bed. They came and talked with my girlfriend, who'd called them initially. Then they left, telling us to call back if things kept up or got worse. That was the end of it, we thought. For about 15 minutes, anyway. Everything was quiet. When Toby discovered we'd locked the doors, he was not happy about that. He started screaming obscenities, yelling, This is my house, over and over. He went back to beating on the chain link fence and screaming at people across the street. Then there was a brief silence, followed by the sound of shattering glass. Toby threw a rock and broke one of the windows in the room next to ours. Had he been one window over, it would have gone straight into our room. We called the police again, now worried that Toby was escalating even further. Luckily for us, however, Toby seemed to have scared himself and stopped throwing rocks at windows after that. The banging against the front and back doors and the chain link fence didn't stop though, not until the police came and took him away for good. We saw him a few days later. We learned that he did in fact not even live there anymore. He was sitting on the grass by the driveway on the phone and gave us the most menacing look when we got out of the car. Luckily, I haven't seen him since and I'll be happy if I never run into him again. Two years ago, I was working in a very small coffee stand, about 30 minutes outside of Seattle. I'd been working as a barista for seven years by that point, and I had never been confronted with a situation that challenged my feeling of security while working alone. Unfortunately, that was all about to change. On Thursday, November 7th, I remember it was my birthday, and it was around 6.45pm. I was starting to close the stand like normal. It was very rare that I would ever have customers come through past 6.30, and because of this, I felt myself jump slightly. When I looked up from the espresso machine and was cleaning, to see a man standing behind the glass of the closed window, adding to my alarm was the fact that this man had made no noise whatsoever and had not tried to grab my attention at all. Instead, he just stood there behind the window in complete silence, with his mouth awkwardly fixed into an unnatural-looking smile. At first, I wasn't even sure if he was a customer at all, considering the idea that he may have been a part of a large group of transients and homeless people who were known to reside in the area. They would occasionally come up to the stand and ask for some free coffee or water. 
For safety reasons, I would typically refrain from serving walk-up customers after dusk, but because I had made eye contact with him, the rules of good customer service required that I at least acknowledge the fact he was there. Reluctantly, I decided to serve him. He introduced himself as Ivan, and he looked to be around my age. He seemed reasonably well-kept in the sense that his clothing and overall appearance looked clean. Despite an Eastern European accent, his English was also very good. His eyes, however, were utterly unnerving. Something about his gaze made my stomach feel uneasy. Immediately, my intuition was alarming me that something about this individual was very off. Every red flag was beginning to show in my mind, and I could not shake the deep and almost overwhelming sense of darkness I felt coming from this person. It was a strange feeling I couldn't ignore. I would soon find out exactly why I was feeling this way. After greeting him as politely as I could manage, despite my growing hesitations, I began to prepare my machine to make him a drink. However, he didn't seem to know what he wanted to order. I asked him twice what I could get started for him, before I silently recognized the fact he was likely not here for the coffee. Eventually, he abandoned ordering altogether, and instead directed our interaction towards some small talk. He asked me where I was from and how long I had been working at the stand. I answered each of his questions with short, abrupt answers, hoping my tone and clear lack of engagement would convey the fact I was not interested in continuing this conversation. Since he was not a paying customer and because I was about to close up, I asked him to leave. After a long pause, he asked me if I had a boyfriend. Annoyed, I snapped at him. No! At this point, I was ready to end our interaction. I told him to leave right now so I could go home as well. Upon hearing this, he walked away from the window and mentioned he was looking forward to seeing me again very soon. After a minute or so, he passed out of sight, but the creepy aura lingering in my gut told me he was not somewhere far away. I just knew he had to be watching me from somewhere just beyond my line of vision. Cautiously, I closed up the stand, locked the doors and windows, and walked out to my car. I drove home. By the following day, I'd forgotten all about the encounter. I went to work as usual, and nothing really out of the ordinary happened. At 7pm, once again, I was just about to end my shift and close the stand. I was nearly finished when I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. I turned my head toward the opposite side of the stand, and there, in full view of both me and the security cameras, stood the same guy from yesterday. He smiled at me with this predatory grin, waved, and then proceeded to pull open the closed window in front of him. Even though he was not presenting himself aggressively, there was something incredibly threatening about him choosing to do that. I cleared my throat and told him as firmly as possible that I was off the clock now and I would not be able to make anything for him. My machine had already been cleaned up and the register was closed out for the day. His smile widened. It's okay. I didn't come here for the coffee anyway. I came here for you. Upon hearing this, I noticed a shift in the energy building. I don't care what you came here for. I told him as sternly as I could manage. It's going to have to wait till tomorrow, because I'm closed. His smile disappeared, and his eyes became even more focused on me. I guess I'll see you tomorrow then. It felt less like a statement and more like a threat. I swallowed, and once he was out of sight, I rushed back to the window and slammed it down, throwing the lock in place again. Despite not being able to visually confirm his presence in the darkness outside, I knew he was still there somewhere. I could feel his eyes staring at me. I ran out and quickly got to my car and drove home. This time, however, he remained heavily on my mind for the rest of the night, robbing me of any sleep at all. The following morning was a Saturday, so as per usual, I got up insanely early for work at 5 a.m., 
I arrived at the stand 10 minutes to 5, and for the first few hours of my shift, everything was as it would normally be. 8.30 rolled around, and as I was admiring the weather outside, I noticed a familiar truck approaching. As it neared closer, I recognized it as my ex-boyfriend Jonathan. I found it exceptionally odd, as he and I were currently on not very friendly terms. He pulled up slowly to the edge of the open window, and I asked him what he was doing here. I'm sure I'm probably not who you're wanting to see today, but I just wanted to come by and wish you a happy belated birthday, and see how you were doing. It was just as I was about to heartily thank him for the birthday wishes that I noticed someone about a hundred yards away, approaching the stand on foot. It was Ivan. I whispered quickly to Jonathan that I needed him to stay there with me, even if another customer pulled in for service, until the guy who was walking up was gone. He agreed to stay. Just as Ivan approached, I walked slowly over to him and noticed right away he must have been crying. His eyes were bloodshot and tears streaked down his cheeks. Disregarding his emotional state, I informed him he needed to leave as I was not going to serve him. Before my statement reached its conclusion, however, he cut off my words abruptly. I don't need this anymore. You can have it, he said. He threw a Russian passport down on the counter in front of me. Puzzled, I picked it up. Why don't you need this anymore? I just won't. I allowed his words to hang between us, while well, I attempted to make sense of what this gesture meant. I felt a strong bite of dread inside my chest. I understood what was about to happen here. No guests from a foreign country would be willing to discard or abandon their passport, unless they intended to do something with absolute finality and were not planning on returning. Ivan's tears were now replaced with a look of what I could only describe as complete and utter insanity. This is the point where the dynamics of our interaction shifted completely. God came to me last night in my dreams. He told me you would be my wife. You are my wife. He had a sickening, sadistic smile curled on the corners of his mouth. You're my wife, and you're gonna come with me right now. He planted his hands firmly onto the ledge of the window and began to lift himself onto it. Realizing that he was attempting to crawl into the stand, I practically threw myself across the small distance between us. I slammed the window down, locking it as well. He pushed his weight back down off the edge and then proceeded to give me a look that made me truly understand the meaning of having one's blood run cold. He ran out of sight. Soon after, I could distinguish beeping of buttons being punched on a keypad, the one that secured the lock on the back door. Ivan was trying to get through that entrance. In my mind, I knew there was no way he could ever manage to guess the four number code. But it's not that easy to just dismiss things like that. What I heard next, though, is something I will never forget. I heard the fateful sound of the keypad indicating a successful entry code, followed by the loud and heavy thud of the steel deadbolt retreating. All I could see was the door in front of me, nothing else. It felt as if time had stopped. The door began to slowly push open from the outside, and I could hear a deafening scream resonate through the walls of the stand. I stood there completely paralyzed and bared witness to the largest knife I had ever seen, entering through the opening of the door first, followed by Ivan's hand firmly gripped around it. It was only then that I realized the scream I was hearing was my own. Ivan passed the remainder of his body through the opening of the back door, and came inside the stand before I could do anything. Let me just say, unless you personally experience a situation that demands you access your fight-or-flight response, you have no idea what response that's going to be. A lot of people say they'll know what they'll do, but most people never realize how you'll react to it in the moment. It's involuntary. I suddenly remember that Jonathan was still in his truck on the other side of the stand, I ran to the window and screamed through the glass to him for help. Jonathan's eyes grow huge and he threw open his driver's side door. He ran out of his truck toward the back of the building. 
Then, in the corner of my vision, I could see Ivan now standing in the small interior of the stand. He was no further than ten feet away from me. I felt a feeling of dread overtake me. The air felt so heavy around me that breathing started to become difficult. Ivan began to close the few feet of space still between us, taking slow, taunting steps in my direction. His knife was gripped firmly in his hand. He spoke softly. You are my wife. Ivan ultimately managed to take a total of three steps toward me before I saw an arm wrap around his neck from behind. I stood there in a state of paralysis due to fear as I watched Jonathan pull him back by the neck with so much force that his feet flew out from under him. Suddenly, they were both on the ground right outside the door, with Jonathan securing him in a headlock. With his mental state, it proved impossible for him to break away. Jonathan yelled strict instructions for Ivan not to move, or he would choke the life out of him. Surprisingly, he remained completely still, never once making any signs of further resistance. Jonathan kicked the knife away from his reach and told me to pick it up and secure it until the cops arrived. It felt like hours before they finally did. It took six officers to force Ivan into the cruiser. The whole time he kept shouting that God had sent him, and he had simply come to collect what was his. This story was told to me second-hand by my cousin. He's a person who has zero interest in fiction and no creativity whatsoever, so I trust him when he told me this actually happened to him. It was back in 2005, during a camping trip. He and four of his friends were illegally camping in one of the national parks in the Midwest. They were hiking well off the permitted trail area and decided to camp in a very scenic spot with a great view of the surrounding landscape. It had been raining heavily the entire time they were hiking, but instead of lightening up, the storm only continued to get worse and worse. It was an unseasonably bad thunderstorm. The only reason that my cousin and his friends hadn't turned around yet was because it would have been more of a bother to hike all the way back and locate their vehicles than it would have been to just set up camp. They knew that they would most likely get caught if they tried to build a fire, but they did so anyway, as they were now soaking wet. They dug a hole in the dirt and surrounded it with stones and built a small shelter over it using tent poles and a tarp. They built up the fire so unnecessarily large that he really regretted it in retrospect. They could have easily caused a wildfire had it not been for the damp state of the forest around them. Eventually, they had to take down the covering because the flames were climbing too high. They were all moderately drunk and started to make Bigfoot whooping calls out into the night and played a game where they tossed a small stone back and forth through the flames at each other. The person who dropped it first had to forfeit his drink to the one who had thrown the stone. Every time the thunder rumbled, one of them had to crack open one of the cheap beers. The rain was so heavy that their shouts and cursing barely traveled through the trees. Later that night, after the rain had put out the fire and my cousin had fallen asleep, the ground beneath him gave way. Two of the tents fell down the slope that had now formed. When they hit the bottom of the steep incline, my cousin and his friend thrashed around and cursed as they tried to free themselves from their tents. When they escaped, they found they were waist deep in a bog of mud. They shambled back up the hill soaking wet, covered in mud from the waist down, and woke up the other three. They gathered their flashlights and went back down to collect their belongings as best they could. After a few minutes of searching through the mud and recovering what was still able to be used, my cousin felt something hard and smooth in the mud. Thinking that it may have been a tent pole, he pulled whatever it was out and was utterly shocked when he realized he was holding a human bone. 
He tossed it aside in a panic and continued to shuffle around through the mud. After a moment, the tone changed, as each of them had found at least two or three more bones of varying sizes embedded in the bog. An argument immediately began as to whether or not these were human bones. None of them were educated enough in human anatomy to determine on the spot with any kind of certainty. My cousin tried to calm everyone down, assuring them that they must be animal bones that had been long since discarded, and this was obviously someone's dumping ground or something. Thing is, none of them had found a hoof or an antler or anything that would make it obvious the bones were not human. My cousin then stated that whatever they were, he didn't want to swim around in the mud with them any longer. They hurried to make a climb back up the slope. Then, though, one of the others removed another bone from the mud, only this one had a large metal piece attached to it. It appeared to be one of those metal implants that are surgically placed into someone to help support broken bones. That's when a real fear took hold of the group. They ran back up the steep incline and packed up everything right away. They doused the smoldering firewood completely before they left and didn't take any of the bones with them. The sun began to rise as they returned to the path. It was decided that they couldn't leave without admitting to what they discovered. They waited at the park station until it opened, and admitted to what they had found immediately. At first, they were met with a casual annoyance and disbelief. They were told to stay put until someone had been out there to confirm the story. After a few hours, the police arrived to question each of them separately. The park service went from annoyed to alarmed. They were transported to the police station and questioned further for hours. They confirmed that what they had found had not just been animal bones. Initially, they threatened my cousin and his friends with jail time, likely just to keep them talking and to scare them into being honest. Then, the park service told them they were going to make them pay some kind of fine for supposed fire damage as well. After a close to eight-hour interrogation session, they were all allowed to leave with their belongings. They never received any sort of follow-up. My cousin was shocked that the incident never got any kind of notable media attention, and later stated to his friends the whole thing had likely been a cover-up. He thought that the park service didn't even want to keep a paper trail on it. My cousin told me that between the five of them, they found well over 30 separate bones, and they knew there must have been plenty more still underfoot. I often wonder if my cousin and his friends stumbled upon a mass grave with dozens of bodies that had been uncovered that night by the storm. One night, three years ago, I got into a fight with my girlfriend at the time. In a rage, I stormed out of her house, and jumped in my truck and just started driving around. I hopped onto the interstate, and about an hour later I was in Nashville. I was so pissed off though that I decided to keep driving. I made it my goal to reach Kentucky and turn around that night. I had never been to Kentucky before, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. I reached Kentucky at about 2.30 in the morning, having left my town a little after 12.30. I grabbed a Coke and a biscuit from the first McDonald's I found, and started heading back to Alabama. As I was heading back though, I realized I was getting quite low on gas. Right as I was about to get to Nashville, I pulled off Interstate 65 to go down the off-ramp. I hit a light and made a left. Hit another light and there's where things started to get really weird. As I pulled up to this light, I noticed something strange. The only other car on the road was at a dead stop at a green light. Weird, I thought to myself, but hey, it's after 3 a.m., Maybe the person is really tired or something. Once I reached the light, the car started to roll forward and under the overpass for the interstate. Then I saw their brakes light up and their headlights go out as well. 
They stopped right under the overpass in the middle of the road. My heart was really starting to race. I was sitting in the turn lane waiting for the light to change. The gas station was right past the overpass. It was like whoever in this car was waiting for me to make a move. I was freaking out. I watched the light turn green and then back to red. I was waiting to see if the car would move, but they didn't do anything. When the light switched back to green again, I flicked on my high beams and crept through the intersection, trying to make out the face of whoever was in the vehicle, but I couldn't see them at all. Lo and behold, as soon as I passed them by, their headlights immediately turned on and they started moving in behind me. At this point, I was extremely scared, staring at the headlights in my rear view instead of the road. I made it the couple hundred feet to the gas station. Thankfully, when I pulled into the station, the first thing I noticed was a car parked out front. I parked at the pump and as I was getting out of my car, I watched the other car roll in behind me. I started to pump the gas. As I was doing so, I watched a man exit that vehicle and start to walk inside. The whole time, from the second his head emerged from the vehicle to the moment he made it inside the store, he was staring right at me with this crazy smile, shaking his head rapidly from left to right. He walked inside and got in line right behind what appeared to be a cop. Now, maybe I watched too many movies, but the whole time he was standing there, I thought he was going to try to kill him or something. Thankfully, he did not do so. Once I had enough gas to get home, I stopped pumping and jumped right back in my car. I double-checked my phone for directions back to the interstate. As I was beginning to leave, that's when I noticed the man immediately leaving his place in line and running out of the store. That's when I panicked. I hit the gas and ran the red light at the overpass. I ran another red light and got back on the interstate. I then went about 85 to 90 miles per hour the whole way home, constantly checking my rear view mirror. It's still one of the creepiest things to ever happen to me, and it really reiterated to me what the detective told all incoming freshmen at college orientation. Nothing good happens after 2 a.m., I'm a journalist, and I remember being told this story by a woman I interviewed for a true crime segment. When this woman was a young girl, say eight years old or so, she started to come downstairs at night and tell her father there was a man in her closet. Well, of course, her father told her there was no such thing as the boogeyman or monsters or anything like that, and sent her right back to bed. This began to happen more frequently on and off for several weeks, though, and finally he got frustrated. He walked her back to the room and said, Look, I'll show you there's nothing in your closet. Well, when he went to open the door, it opened an inch, and then he felt someone immediately pull it back and slam it shut. It turned out there really was a man living in her closet. It was a pervert who would sneak into the house every night through the window and stare at the girl from the closet while she slept. The dad beat the hell out of him, and the pervert went to prison for many years. I did some research into her story after she told me this as well. It was about 20 years after the initial events happened. It turned out the man had just recently gotten out of jail, and no one knew his whereabouts. I was driving along this road that stretches out over about a hundred kilometers. It was about 1 a.m. and I was at the end of the road. It was a very desolate area, with neighbors being kilometers apart from each other. It was a familiar route for me. I drive on it once every few months, just to go anywhere really. Because of how isolated it is, there are no street lights at all, and you have to rely on only your car headlights to see. On this particular night, I was feeling a little strange. Somehow, something about the route seemed unfamiliar, 
which was impossible really. It's just one long road with the occasional turn off. I kept driving along toward the place I'd normally turn around. I came up to this certain point in the road where there was one lone house with their car parked in the driveway. I could see there was someone lingering in the passenger seat. I could see there was someone lingering in the passenger seat. I thought that was quite weird because it was so late at night. As I got closer to this house, they turned the car on and flashed their high beam lights at me. I didn't pay much attention to this. Then though, I drove past them and looked into my rear view mirror to see what they were up to. They'd pulled out of their driveway onto the road and were now heading the same direction I was. I was a little bit nervous at this point. About five minutes up the road, I looked into my rear view mirror again and the car that had pulled out behind me was gone. I looked to my left and noticed I was near an abandoned convenience store on the side of the road. This was a landmark I remembered driving past plenty of times whenever I would drive up here. I distinctly remember that in front of the store a couple of feet away there was an old phone booth. Both the store and the booth were run down and covered in graffiti. Neither had been used in a very long time. As I got closer though, I saw there was a dark figure behind the glass of the booth. They were looking right at me, and I could see their eyes in my headlights. As I got even closer, they stepped out of the booth and began moving toward the road I was on. I started to speed up. That's when this really bright light came on behind me, and the person took off toward the back of the store. I looked in my rear view mirror once more and saw the car that had flashed me earlier. It was about a hundred meters behind me. It followed me for another kilometer or so, until we reached a turn-off road, where it then made a U-turn and went back the other way. I had to go back the way I'd came once I reached the end. I drove past the phone booth once more, and there didn't seem to be anyone there. Then I reached the house where the car had initially pulled out. It was back in its driveway, with the driver still in the front seat. I have no idea what all that was about or even if those two events were really connected in any way, but it was very unsettling on such a dark and desolate road at night. This happened to me when I was a little kid, but no one was ever found in my basement. It was my first time staying home alone, while my whole family was out at my brother's ball game. I was 13, I think. I was on the phone with a friend of mine, feeling so grown up, when all of a sudden someone beeped on the other line. I told my friend that I'd be right back, and clicked over. Immediately, the creepiest voice I've ever heard whispered into my ear. Hello, little girl. I'm the man in your basement. Honestly, I laughed it off at first and just hung up on that line, thinking it was a prank call. I was pretty confident at my age that my neighborhood was pretty safe. So I figured someone was just messing with me, knowing that it was my first time home alone. They beeped in again so I clicked over once more. Don't hang up on me again. The lights started to flicker, and there was a banging under my feet. Our basement was actually just an area connected to the garage. I heard what sounded like footsteps coming up the garage steps to get into our kitchen. I kept trying to hang up and call the police, but every time I tried, he was still on the phone on the other line. Thankfully, my friend told her parents what was happening, and they ran to the neighbor's house to call the police for me. I sat there petrified with a butcher knife, hiding right next to my front door. It was the only place in the house downstairs that couldn't be seen from a window. Eventually, I clicked over and heard a police dispatcher on the phone, saying to stay on the line with her until the police got to my house. Once they arrived, they found no signs of forced entry, though we did have a broken window pane on our outside garage door that had been messed up for months prior. My guess is that that's how the man got inside. The police assumed that I was just a paranoid girl 
and they were going to leave me home alone again after they cleared the house for intruders. Fortunately, a family friend happened to have been driving by and saw the cops there. They stopped to see if everything was okay and gave me a ride to the school where my brother's ball game was. My parents were skeptical that anything had actually happened, but we did get a security system not much longer after that. And my parents both got cell phones. This was 1994, I think, so cell phones weren't popular yet. After that happened, I swear there was someone stalking me for years. When I got older, I would leave my apartment locked and bolted and come back to find appliances on. I lived in four different places and would often get these strange phone calls from someone with a similar voice. Sometimes cars would be randomly parked down the road from where I was living and speed up and slam on the brakes. As I would run inside, I would hear loud bangs outside. I moved out to the country to get away from all this, and nothing has happened since then. I've been in my current house and I am married now, but I still get paranoid all the time whenever I'm home alone. I worked nights at a warehouse. Often, I would drive my motorcycle there because it's fun and saves money on gasoline. I was coming home one night. There was a heavily wooded, bushed area right on the side of the road. I remember pulling up to a stop sign, only to notice some weird guy standing in the bushes. I came to a stop and looked right at him. We made eye contact and he started walking towards me immediately. I nearly killed my engine as I floored it the hell out of there. I got a mile or so down the road and pulled over. I pulled out my handgun and then called the police as well. I didn't see the man anywhere around me. The police went and checked out the area supposedly, but there was no one there by the time they arrived. It was such a startling moment seeing a man emerging from the bushes and approaching me on a dark road like that. When I was a teenager in Colorado Springs, we all used to crawl through this small tunnel that was directly under the interstate to get back and forth from our neighborhood without having to jump fences or run across the highway. One drunken night alone, I was on my way home at about 2 or 3 in the morning. I remember emerging from the tunnel, only to find myself face to face with this huge Rottweiler staring right at me. I was in shock for a moment, and my stomach dropped. I instinctively started yelling at the dog to go home. He just stood there glaring at me. Every move I slowly tried to make to get away, he would bark and show his teeth to me. I started stomping toward him in a dominant manner, yelling at it to go away. He turned and took some steps back, but still proceeded in snarling at me and baring his sharp teeth. I drunkenly started to power walk away. All of a sudden, I heard the dog charging toward me from behind. He was right behind me and right about to pounce on me. I turned around and fell backward. When I looked up, though, he was no longer continuing the attack. Instead, he turned and ran away. I know it might not seem that scary since nothing that bad happened to me, but if that dog had decided to continue with that attack, I imagine I would not be here on this day to tell you this. I don't know if that dog was someone's pet or what, and why he decided to stop attacking me after I fell down. I'll never know exactly why my life was spared that night. I lived in New Mexico for several years before moving to the Midwest. My friend Amy and I would spend many days exploring the remote corners of New Mexico, discovering abandoned ghost towns and enjoying the quiet, desolate beauty of the desert. One afternoon in March of 2010, we were traveling to Albuquerque. Always up for exploring, 
we took some back roads rather than traveling the more direct highway route. One leg of our journey had us on NM55. It's a remote, teeny tiny two-lane highway. We loved these types of roads even up until this day. This part of New Mexico is a flat and desolate desert area. You can see for miles, and there's virtually nothing but dirt and rock between towns. Towns can be miles apart as well. We were continuing along this road when we saw a white pickup truck just ahead of us, going in the same direction. All of a sudden, this truck just stopped and went sideways in the middle of the highway, blocking off both lanes. We were about a mile away from him at this point, and as we got closer, we began to feel uneasy. We could see no reason for him to do this. We were the only other vehicle out there, and we began wondering if we should just turn around. Rather than come up to him and have to stop, we were about a half mile from him when he pulled over to the opposite side of the highway. His truck was still pointed in the direction we were going, though. We tried to relax a little. Surely this guy was a rancher or something. Maybe he was checking something on his land. As we passed him by, we noticed a few things. One, there was only one person in the truck, a middle-aged guy who never took his eyes off us. And two, he appeared to be talking into a walkie-talkie. A few seconds after we passed him by, he pulled back onto the highway and started following behind us. He never got too close, though. He would always get within a car lengths away, then drop back a little, then speed back up again always maintaining one car length away. We were getting nervous. We realized how alone we really were. We had seen no other traffic on that road, and we hadn't told anyone about our great idea to take this detour. We checked our cell phones, and neither of us had a signal. Typical for remote New Mexico, but quite scary given our present situation. Amy was driving and speeding up, while well, I frantically checked the map, hoping to find a road that would have more traffic than this one. There was no other road. We had to travel down this one to get to the next town, which was Mountaineer. Turning around to go back the other way didn't seem like a good option either. After a few minutes, we saw another pickup truck coming towards us. This one was going very slowly, maybe 20 miles per hour if that. This truck was old and beat up, whereas the one behind us was new. Amy had us up to 75 miles per hour, which was not typical for us on these 55-mile highways. We blew past the old pickup. As we passed it by, we saw there was another middle-aged man inside, and he was also talking into a walkie-talkie. After the white pickup passed him, he pulled a U-turn and pulled in behind it. As we watched all of this, we could see the guy in the white pickup truck talking into his walkie-talkie. No doubt these two knew each other, and we were being deliberately followed. For the first and only time in my life, I felt like my life was in danger. They stayed right behind us. We watched out for obstacles in the road. We truly thought that old beat-up truck must have set a trap somewhere, and our vehicle would be disabled somehow. We even talked about driving off-road into the fields. We were in an SUV, but this was obviously their territory, and we were afraid of what might happen if we went off-road and got cornered somewhere. We stayed on the highway. By now, the white pickup truck guy was right on top of us. We could see him talking into his walkie-talkie and staying right on our bumper now. The old beat-up truck guy was right on top of him. The three of us sped down the highway. The guy in the white truck inched closer and closer. His maneuvering and edging made it apparent he was trying to bump into us. I watched helplessly as he got within inches of our back bumper. Amy floored it. We were passing 80 miles an hour and edging up to 90. The road was flat and deserted, but any little thing going wrong would have been catastrophic. We absolutely were not going to slow down or stop if we could help it. The white truck pulled into the opposite lane and started to gain speed. The only thing we could think was that he wanted to pass us and get in front of us, 
If he got in front of us and his buddy was behind us, we would be boxed in and trapped. We both looked frantically at the rocky desert on both sides of us. Our only option was to off-road it. Should we risk it? We could speed through the desert and make it to safety in one piece. As we topped a small incline, we saw a sign that said Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument. It pointed toward a road on the left. At that moment, a blue pickup truck pulled out of that road and onto the highway in front of us. As we came upon the blue pickup, we saw the plate said U.S. Park Service. We looked at each other and then looked behind us. Both pickup trucks did U-turns immediately and went the opposite way. We followed the blue pickup truck to Mountain Air and then made our way to Albuquerque. I don't know exactly what those guys' intentions were, but they weren't good for sure. There was something seriously wrong out there. I notified the state police and they said they would keep an eye on things. About 15 years ago, my mom and cousin were coming home from visiting my aunt, who lived two hours away. The drive takes you through the desert and up some mountains, but there is a shortcut you can take to avoid the mountain path. It shaves about 10 minutes off the drive time. The only problem is, that shortcut takes you literally through the middle of nowhere. It's a two-lane road with nothing for 30 miles. No houses, no shops, no lights, not even those roadside emergency phone booths. They were driving along through the shortcut at about 11 p.m. or so when they spotted something in the middle of the road. At first, my cousin thought it was a rock or something, so she slowed down to go around it. Once she got closer, though, she realized it appeared to be a woman with long black hair and what looked like a burlap shawl wrapped around her. She was crouched down, facing away from my cousin. My mom said she thought the lady might have been in some trouble, so they pulled up next to her and asked her if she was okay or if she needed any help. My cousin said that the lady stood up and looked at them, then let out a shriek like a banshee. She insists that the woman's eyes were pitch black and her skin was as pale as a sheet. She was really skinny, almost anorexic even. I attribute this to being dark out and her mind perhaps playing tricks on her on such a desolate and eerie road. But nonetheless, it was enough to really spook the hell out of her. She punched the accelerator and shot out of there. The lady briefly tried to chase after them but they lost sight of her soon after. They didn't stop for anything, even running a stop sign until they got to the next town, where they finally stopped at a gas station to grab something to drink and collect their thoughts. Now, she won't go through the shortcut at all, even when someone else is driving, and she insists on always taking the main highway instead. I worked for McDonald's for my first job in 2017. The McDonald's I worked at was in a very rural part of town, and at the time the McDonald's was open for 24 hours. While I worked there, I had a boss that was a huge jerk and always made me work the night shift. I really didn't want to, but at the time I really needed the money and I wasn't in the position to not be working. Therefore, I really had no choice in the matter. I took the night shift figuring that it wouldn't be that bad. I wasn't the only one working it. I had a few other co-workers with me. They mostly made the food or took the customer orders at the drive-thru. I was the one at the register taking people's orders. Anyway, one day I was told I would be working from 8pm to 1am. I worked the first few hours normally. After 10 p.m., people started coming in less and ordering less as well. It was at around 15 minutes before my shift was set to end and the other workers had already left. I was starting to get ready to leave myself when I got a text from the other person who was supposed to work when I left. 
He was on his way, but he was going to be a little bit late. That meant I would have to wait for even longer. I was on my phone scrolling through Snapchat when someone pulled up in a blue truck into the McDonald's parking lot. It was an older guy, maybe around 30 or so. He walked up to the counter and I politely asked if I could take his order. Oh, could I get a value fry and a water? I told him sure thing. I told him his total was 105. He then reached into his pocket and pulled out a $50 bill. He put his hand out as if he wanted me to have it. I was a bit confused as to why he would give me $50. Oh, it's alright sir, it's only a $1 order. You don't need to give me $50. Ah, don't worry, you could keep the change. I told him we didn't accept bills over $20. As soon as I told him that, his smile faded into a frown. I could tell he seemed to be getting quite angry. I asked the man if he was okay, and he told me in a very furious voice to shut up, or else he would cut me. He leaned toward me, and I could see he was concealing something in his pocket. I couldn't quite see what it was, but since he'd said the word cut, I figured it must have been a knife. I'm a 5 foot 7 girl, and this guy was around 6 foot 3. There was no way I could fight him, even if I tried. I was very uncomfortable at this point and wanted to leave already. Thank God I saw headlights approaching the McDonald's. It was the guy who was supposed to be working after me. Once the man saw his car pulling up, he ran back out the front door. I told the person working after me what happened, and he offered to call the cops for me. I stupidly said no. Unfortunately, it does not end there. I had left work and was in my car driving home when I saw a pair of headlights appear behind me. It seemed as if they were following me. I wanted to know for sure if they were, so I purposefully made a few wrong turns. They did too, and it was confirmed they were indeed following me. Thankfully, I knew the area I was in very well and knew there was a police station not too far away from where I was. I drove down to the station, pulled in and got out of my vehicle. The car that was following me slowly passed by the station and kept on driving. As they did so, I realized the vehicle was the exact same blue truck that the man had been driving. The reason why he stopped following me and kept going was because I parked in the police station and he didn't want to get caught. I waited about 10 minutes and drove home soon after, making sure no one followed me any further. The next day, I called up my boss and told him I quit. I'll never do another night shift again. This took place in the middle of July. It was hurricane season, which meant almost every day it would rain like crazy. I liked the rain most of the time. I found it quite relaxing, actually, and calming. One day, I had the day off from work, and I honestly really needed the break. Work was very stressful at the time. I work as a store manager, and I would have to deal with angry customers and answer calls all day. Believe it or not, after a while, it gets very stressful and grating. Anyway, it was around 7 p.m. or so. I was lying down watching some show on my TV when I heard a tap coming from my window. My bedroom is a master bedroom, and the back of my bed faces the window. I heard it loud and clear. The curtains were closed, and I was curious as to who or what was outside tapping against it. I gathered up the courage to go open the curtains and look outside, but there was nothing there. It was dark and raining heavily, so I brushed it off, thinking it may have been a twig or a branch blown against it. My fears were confirmed, though, when I heard a door shut from upstairs and then heard footsteps following that. I immediately grabbed my gun from under my bed and hid in the closet. I then heard footsteps coming down the stairs. I don't live alone. I live with my wife but my wife was currently in New York for her high school reunion. Whoever was in my house right now 
was clearly a stranger. I heard footsteps coming down the hall, along with doors opening and closing. Then the footsteps came to my bedroom. I could see a man through the cracks of the closet. He was very tall, maybe about six foot five or so, and was wearing all black. He looked under the bed and then in the bathroom. He was now walking over to the closet. I quickly put some clothes on top of myself in order to not be seen. He opened the closet door with a lot of force and waited for a few seconds before closing it. There was complete silence in the room now. I almost thought that maybe the man had left. I quietly removed the clothes from myself and slowly started making my way towards my bed to grab my phone. I was going to call the cops. Then, however, as I approached my bed, I felt something grab my foot from underneath it and start pulling me downward. I felt something extremely sharp going through my foot. I looked down and the man was underneath my bed. I shot him in the arm and he screamed in pain while getting up and running out the front door. I still called the cops, but unfortunately they never found him. I still don't know how he even managed to break into my house, as we did have an alarm system throughout the home. The man had sliced my foot open, but luckily I was able to recover just fine. I really hope that man does never try to come back. Working in a hotel isn't the most glamorous job in the world. Actually, it's pretty far from that. But when I needed a job, there was an opening at the local hotel. They gave it to me right away. I was 18 and freshly out of high school. I decided against college because I was in my do the opposite of everything your parents want you to do stage of my life. Granted, I know not everyone has to go to college to be successful, but in my case, I can't help but wish that maybe I had decided. Then, I wouldn't have had to go through all the horrible things my job brought into my life. There were several small incidents that happened within the first few months that I found uncomfortable and gross. Men hitting on me, asking me how much it would cost for me to join them for the night, then there was the actual physical disgusting stuff. I worked at the front desk, but we were severely short-staffed constantly, so I did housekeeping for about a month or so. Let me tell you, it was truly horrifying the things I've seen. Pretty much every bodily fluid on almost every inch of a room at one point or another. I finally had to tell my manager that I was going to quit if I had to clean even one more room. He assured me that I wouldn't be necessary anymore, and my job would be easy from there on out. It was around 2 in the morning during an intense snowstorm. Nobody had checked in for hours on end, and I figured the rest of the night would be just as calm, maybe even silent. I heard the door open, though, and the bell that hung off it rung loudly. I saw two guys wearing large, heavy coats. They stomped in their heavy work boots to get the snow off them. They were laughing about something, but they immediately stopped when they saw me sitting at the front desk. Their smiles even dropped from their faces, and they made a weird look at each other. They walked up to the desk slowly as I put on my fake customer service smile and tried my best to seem friendly and helpful. I was tired and a bit worried though. They didn't have a reservation, so I booked them a standard room with two queen-size beds. I thought everything seemed pretty normal with them until they were walking away. I heard them start talking about how good-looking they thought I was. With me being freshly 18, I figured that was just something I would have to start getting used to, so I brushed it off and continued on with my night. I was reading a book to pass the time, when I heard someone enter the lobby again. It was one of the men I mentioned before. He walked up to the front desk and leaned over it, getting way closer than I was comfortable with being. He reeked of beer and cigarettes. I asked him if there was anything I could help him with. I was hoping it would be something simple, and he'd leave back to his room as quickly as possible, but life doesn't work like that. 
He told me the shower drain wasn't working in their room and that he needed someone to fix it immediately. I tried calling maintenance, but of course they weren't going to answer. I politely told the man that the soonest anyone was going to be able to fix it was the next morning. He started getting really angry, saying stuff like he was going to complain to my manager and leave bad reviews. By the time he actually started screaming, I decided it might be more worth it for me to just check it out than deal with him waking up everyone else in the hotel. That would mean even more complaints, and possibly me getting fired. Granted, it wasn't the smartest idea for me to enter a room alone with two men, but I wasn't thinking straight. I was exhausted and just wanted his rant to end. It was a decision I would end up regretting for the rest of my life. He led me over to his room, and I asked he and his friend to wait outside while I checked the shower drain. They obliged and everything seemed normal at first. I was leaning over the bathtub and had turned on the faucet. The water was running down perfectly fine. I yelled out that it was working normally, but just as I started to stand up, I heard the door slam behind me. I turned around quickly and screamed when I was met with the larger of the two men, standing in the bathroom with me. He grabbed me by my shoulders and slammed me against the wall. Be quiet, or I'll make this a lot worse than it has to be. He almost started to laugh when he said that. I started to scream as loud as I could, hoping one of the other guests would hear me. He released one of his hands to cover my mouth. With one of my arms free, I did something I'm sure he didn't expect me to do in that moment. I unholstered my concealed handgun. I held it not far away from his side and pulled the trigger. I knew I had no time to hesitate right now. My ears started to ring like crazy. He released me and fell to the ground. My adrenaline was pumping and I barely even noticed the door open and the other man coming in. I pointed the gun right at him and told him to leave or I'd kill him right then and there. He knew that I meant it when he saw his friend bleeding out on the floor in front of me. He didn't even say a word before running out of that hotel room faster than I ever would have thought possible. He stepped over the man's body on the floor. I had no idea if the guy was alive or dead. I just had to get out of that room. I stepped out into the hallway, leaving bloody footprints behind me. I realized I must have stepped in some blood as I went over him. Multiple guests were standing out in the hallway, demanding to know why they just heard what sounded like a gunshot. A woman in the room next door must have seen the look on my face because she immediately came over to make sure I was okay. The police arrived not long after, and the room was cordoned off. The man was taken to the hospital, and surprisingly he was not dead and didn't end up dying either. An investigation was done, but the security camera showed proof I was lured into the room by the men. They did re-enter after I asked them to stay in the hallway, and the audio was very clear. I was never charged with anything regarding the shooting. The other man was found only a couple of miles away. His truck had gotten stuck in a snowbank. They were both charged with kidnapping. The man who cornered me in the bathroom was also charged with assault. They were both sentenced to three years in prison, as well as given no contact orders upon their release. I quit my job not long after and decided to enroll in college instead. I'm currently studying English, and I hope to get into writing one day. If there's one thing I can advise anyone to do in this scary world that we live in, it's learn how to protect yourself. It could save your life one day. For some context, I'm a 24-year-old female who had just moved into a new apartment with her boyfriend. We live in the north of Italy, in a quiet and wealthy neighborhood. I think it's easily the nicest zone of the city, or at least I thought so. My boyfriend works not so far away from our apartment. For about a month or so, he had no car, so when he finished up his work, usually at around midnight to 2 a.m., he would come home by foot, bike, or his boss would give him a ride. Yesterday, he had no lift after work, and since he had been sick the previous night, I told him that I would go pick him up. 
It wasn't the first time I had done this, and I'm not afraid to go out late at night, even if our city is pitch black. After midnight, all the city lights are turned off, including the ones in the streets, the squares, the parking lots, etc. It's a municipal rule since the high price of electricity in these late months. This time, though, something inside me told me not to go outside this late alone. Being the lovely girlfriend that I am, though, I ignored that weird feeling and decided to go anyway. I really should have listened to my gut. As soon as my boyfriend called me, I put on my boots, which are entirely covered with studs, and went out our door. After the hallway, there's a glass door, and near it is a button that opens the outside gate from the inside. I opened the glass door, and whilst it was closing behind me, I spotted a man's head peeking out from behind a wall near my parked car. I was able to see him because our building has its own light at the exit, which doesn't turn off at night. As soon as we made eye contact, the man hid behind the wall once more. My blood went cold. It was pitch black late at night, with the main door behind me closed and the gate in front of me wide open. If I wanted to get back inside, I would have to turn my back to this man. God knows what would happen if I had my back to a creepy dude hiding near my car. I had no other choice but to run to it and hope that the man would not catch me. I checked what boots I was wearing, and realizing that I had studs all over my shoes made me feel a little more comfortable. I squeezed my car keys in my hand, turned on my phone's flashlight, and took a few little steps out the gate. I then slammed it as hard as I could in order to scare the creepy man if he was still around. I ran to my car, jumped inside it, and locked the doors as fast as I could. Then I sped away. I haven't seen the same man again, but the next day on the local news, I read a girl had been robbed of her purse at the same time I went out. It happened in a street right near my home, too. Other people had also spotted the sketchy man walking around the city at night. I'm really glad I was able to spot him and make him run away. I can't even imagine what would have happened to me if I didn't have that light on my building's side. I feel really lucky. But the fear I felt in that moment will stick with me for a long time. Everyone, please be safe out there. I work for my dad at his small construction business. He runs a yard and warehouse full of materials, as well as manages the job sites the workers are at. Since I was only 17 at the time, my job was basically to be the errand boy. I'd drop materials back and forth, pick up anything that was needed depending on the job, though some materials would need to be there before workers arrived because they would need them so they could get to work right away in the morning. Every once in a while, during busy weeks, I'd have to start work really early, like 2 or 3 in the morning. That was to make sure I could drop everything off in time. Obviously, this was only during the summer, when I didn't have school, so I really had no excuse for not being able to work. I liked doing the deliveries early, though, because it was calm and I didn't have to deal with anyone telling me what to do. On this day, I arrived at the warehouse at 3 a.m. and loaded everything up. I then started making my way to the job site. It was a repair job on an old and maybe even abandoned building at the very edge of our town. When I got there, I saw a truck parked right outside. Its lights were off, and it didn't look like anyone was nearby. It was way too early for anybody to be working here, so I wasn't expecting to see any cars there. I parked and got out, walking up to it and seeing that it wasn't a company vehicle either. The windows were tinted, and I couldn't see inside. I turned and looked at the building, trying to see if anyone was here. I called out asking if anyone was inside, but got no response. I felt a little bit weird about the situation. I pulled my phone out and called my dad. It rang for a minute, then went to voicemail. Figuring it was probably just a worker's personal truck that they'd left there, I went back to my own vehicle and started unloading the materials. 
It took probably an hour or so. Then I got back in and started to drive off. As I left the area though, I looked in my rear view mirror and suddenly the truck's lights had turned on. I practically slammed on my brakes, stopping on the side of the road and watching as the truck started to back out. Someone had been in there the whole time. Knowing that, I was sure it couldn't have been a worker because they definitely would have responded to me. I sat and watched as they made their way out of the parking area and out onto the road. I grabbed my phone and quickly dialed my dad's phone number again. While I waited for him to pick up, I looked over, seeing that the truck had stopped right next to me. I stared at their window, knowing that someone behind it was probably staring at me. I tossed my phone on the back seat and started to drive forward. The truck was quick to match my speed and tried to prevent me from getting back onto the road. There was nowhere else for me to go. To my left were trees and to my right was this truck blocking my way. I started to panic. I put the car in reverse and tried to back up. The truck did the same until they eventually tapped my car, making me lose control and slide off the shoulder. I hit the side of a tree. The truck quickly stopped right at the tip of the road as if they were going to get out. Then their brake light suddenly turned off again as they slammed it back in drive and sped away. Just 20 seconds later, another car pulled up to the side of the road and a man got out and ran up to me, asking me if I was okay. I didn't know his name at the time, but it was one of the workers that was just arriving at the job site. He only saw the last bit of what happened, but he recognized the other truck. It was Samuels, another worker my dad had hired a few months ago. It turned out a bunch of tools and materials were missing from the job site, adding up to almost $10,000. That's only from one night, too. He could have been slowly stealing a few things over time over the past few months. When I think about what happened that night, I think Samuel must have thought that by me seeing his truck, I would trace it all back to him and he'd get caught by my dad. He tried to stop me. I don't know what he would have done to me, but considering I was the only witness, it's likely he wouldn't have gotten caught as long as I was never seen again. Unfortunately though, his name and everything else didn't add up to anything. It was likely he was either an illegal immigrant or some kind of felon that went through the effort of getting a fake ID and work documents. I was never expecting something like that to ever happen, but at least it's really unlikely I'll ever see that guy again. I used to live in the middle of nowhere for my job. I would move about every year or so for the first couple of years that I worked at the company. All of the cities that I lived in were cool in their own way, but this one in particular was way out there. There were lots of wildlife and land nearby, but not as much of a city if you know what I mean. I was able to live in a pretty nice house because of the location. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't a mansion or anything like that, but it was a lot nicer than the other places I had lived in. One thing I liked to do was go for runs to get some exercise. I liked to go run along the side of some nearby roads. There were no sidewalks way out here, but the streets were never very busy either. Not that many people drove on the roads near my house especially, with how quiet of an area it was. I could easily jog on the side of the road without any worries. One night when I got back from work, I went out for a run as usual. I worked all kinds of hours, so I would get off at all different times. It was a little bit later than usual this time, but I still had a lot of energy after work. I left my house and went onto my street. Then I connected to a little bit of a busier road. By busier, I only mean it was a larger road there would still rarely be any cars that went down it. It was probably about 9 o'clock at night or so. I was jogging on the side of the road. This road went down for miles on end, so usually I would just run along it until I got a bit bored, then turn around and go back. After a little bit, probably about 10 minutes or so, a car passed by me traveling at a pretty slow speed. 
I didn't really pay much attention to what it did after it passed me by, but it must have turned somewhere, then gone back without me noticing, maybe on another road or something, because several minutes later, I saw that same car coming from the same direction as before. At first, I thought maybe it was a different car that was the same make and model, but that would be a pretty strange coincidence. I was pretty focused on running, and not really looking around much, but I still noticed that this was weird. The car slowly passed me by again. Then, when it got a ways up, it started to pull over on the side of the road. I was wondering what was going on. This was the middle of nowhere. Maybe the person was lost. As the car was pulling over on the same side of the road I was running on, it then turned and sort of went at an angle where it was right in my way. I was either going to have to go way up onto the grass to pass them, or way out into the road. As I approached, I was planning to go up into the grass, but then the car's door opened up. I saw a man starting to step out, who was wearing all black clothing and a ski mask. When I saw that, I started to turn around immediately. The guy was still a ways up. I continued to run, but now I was going in the opposite direction. I didn't look back, but I heard the sound of the guy getting back inside the car. Soon after, I heard the car starting to drive after me again. As the car approached me, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't have my phone on me when I went out jogging. I wouldn't bring anything. I only had my Fitbit and my one house key. I didn't like running with things in my pockets, so I wouldn't be able to call for help or anything. I never figured I would have to, living way out here. The guy in the car would be able to easily catch up to me soon, though. I got extremely lucky. I saw another car driving down the road towards me up ahead. The other car was still following me from behind. But then I ran into the middle of the road. I started trying to wave down the car that was coming my direction so it would stop. The car slowed down. And as it was stopping, the car that was following me went around us and drove past. The driver of the car that stopped rolled down their window. I think they were starting to ask me what was going on when I pointed at the other car and told them they had been following me. I watched the car go out of sight. Then I quickly ran back toward my house. I was able to make it back to my street, then go to my home. When I got home, I called the police and reported the incident. After that night, I stopped jogging outside at night. It was so crazy for that to happen there because the area was literally in the middle of nowhere. I don't live there anymore, but I still think about that experience all the time. Two years ago, I went on a road trip with my girlfriend. We were traveling across the country and stopping at a lot of parks. Most of the ones we were trying to go to were state parks, but not all of them. We both like to go hiking and do that sorts of stuff. My girlfriend is a lot more into it than I am, but I do enjoy it somewhat. On this road trip in particular, we were about five days in, and everything was going pretty well so far. We had seen lots of cool places, and were out west somewhere I don't even remember. It was either New Mexico, Colorado, or Arizona, I think. Anyway, it was approaching sunset, and we had just been to a park a couple of hours ago. Now we were driving to our next hotel, which was still a few hours away. I remember that my girlfriend really liked this particular area we were in. She saw a sign for another park and asked me to stop and look at it. I took the exit, which led to a somewhat quiet road. The land was a mixture of mountains and deserts. We drove along this road for a few miles, then saw a small parking lot for a hiking path. My girlfriend asked me to pull in. Then she wanted to know if I was down for a quick hike or to just look around. If I had to estimate, I would say that we had about 20 minutes of daylight left before things got really dark. I said alright because it was a pretty cool area. We parked and got out of the car. Our car was the only one in the entire parking lot and the road by it. It was very quiet. 
We got out and started walking on the trail. I remember being about 10 minutes into it. We took some pictures of the scenery. When my girlfriend mentioned that she had no service, I looked at my phone and I didn't have any either. We walked a little bit farther, and by then it was getting really dark. We started heading back. This particular trail was sort of rough terrain. It was a lot of hills and rocks and trees and stuff. We eventually made it back to the beginning of the trail. When we approached the entrance to the parking lot, though, I noticed something. There was another car in the lot. When I got closer, I saw there was someone standing right outside our vehicle. I was walking in front of my girlfriend and stopped and motioned for her to do the same. We went to the side a little bit and hid next to a giant rock. We were mostly obstructed from the view of whoever was in the parking lot. I told my girlfriend what I had seen. The person at the car looked like they were maybe trying to break in or something. I decided to peek around the corner of the rock to get a better view. When I looked, I saw the person was now walking towards us. I moved back, and we both headed the opposite way back down the trail. By now, it was almost completely dark out. I knew something was going on, but the person was not saying anything. Soon, they entered the trail behind us. My girlfriend and I went off trail and went up on top of a rock. We then went through some brush. It got really steep at one point, but we were able to then cut back around. We did not make our way back to the path, but went off path in the direction of the parking lot. Within a minute or two, we got back to the lot, coming out of some brush. I heard the person somewhere behind us. We then ran for the car and jumped inside quickly. I drove out of there. When we were leaving and driving down the road, I saw the person emerging from where we had. I got back to another road after that, and we weren't followed or anything. We didn't make any more stops near sunset after either. I'm not sure who that person was. It wasn't any kind of park official, because their car was an old beater, and the person was not wearing any kind of uniform. The way they were standing next to my car, it was like they were trying to open the door or look inside. I'm really glad we were able to get away from that guy, whoever he may have been.